ones fighting for the truth of what happened to John O'Keefe. And me and my family and my attorneys and my team have marshaled every resource to get to the truth. It just feels like no one else wants it. And Karen, just to be clear, you didn't do it. We know who did it, Steve. We know. And we know who spearheaded this cover-up. You all know. Yes, we do. And no, she didn't do it. No, she didn't do it. This is an innocent woman. She didn't do it. I tried to save his life. Yeah. I tried to save his life at 6 in the morning. I was covered in his blood. I was the only one trying to save his life. Why'd you admit to it? He didn't, she didn't admit to it. She didn't admit to anything close to that. Nothing close to that. And you should know that. That was like three or four times she admitted to it. No, no, she didn't. No, that's not true. She asked a question. It makes absolutely no sense. That is the Commonwealth grasping at straws. If it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. We have the eight letters. We've seen them. We've read them. We are using them. The genie cannot be put back in the bottle. Yeah, LTL true crime. We going deep in the dark. Yeah, yeah peeling back the layers, expose the hidden mark. Oh, yeah. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie. Get in into minds of the wicked, no alibi. LTL true crime unraveling the web of evil No stone left unturned, we diving to the prime Yeah, we digging up the dirt, bringing justice to the crime LTL true crime unveiling dark realities every time Yeah, LTL true crime, we going deep in the dark yeah. Peeling back the layers, exposed to him more oh, yeah. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie Didn't think some mind, something wicked, no alibi Oh, well, well, what's going on, everybody? Nice to see everybody here. Welcome back to LTL True Crime. We're live here on this Saturday, April 13th, 2024. It's so nice to be back. It's so good to be back. I know I've been kind of out of action lately, um, building out my new studio. It has been a very uh, tasking and stressful pro uh, process, but we, we've been making a lot of progress in the room. And uh, I think that the, the completion is going to be coming pretty soon. Just a couple more key things that we need to put in place and then hook up uh, audio and video. Um, I'm actively looking at someone to build me a new computer uh, to get that all together in the studio that can run all that equipment efficiently and effectively so I don't have any problems down the road. But other than that, visually it's coming together. I have a few more things that I need to, to do in there to kind of button up the visual aspect of it. But um, it's just we're really waiting on audio and video right now. Um, but it's nice to see everybody here. Welcome in, everybody. If this is your first time here, make sure to subscribe uh, and hit that like button. Leave a comment down below um, after this live post. That would be great. And if you want to support me in any way, I have my link at the top. That is my link tree uh, link. You can click on that, and it gives you all my affiliated links in ways that you can support me. So I would appreciate it. Or you can just super chat while we chat. Um, if you want your 
chat uh, brought up and highlighted. Send a super chat over. We'll pull it up and we can talk about it. But um, again, listen, we had a very uh, fiery day yesterday, very important day in the Karen Reed case. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been able to catch up on a lot of it lately because I've been so busy with my personal life and getting the studio together. But it was nice last night uh, in the studio. We threw it up on the big TV and we watched uh, some of the hearing from yesterday, and it's definitely something that I want to go through today. So we are going to go through the hearing. I'll give you my talking points. I have a takeaway presentation I'm going to bring up here really quick and just talk about some of the key takeaways from yesterday's uh, hearing, some very important. We got a lot of new information, a lot of new information, a lot of motions, a lot of lies, a lot of corruption. Uh, we have to ask ourselves, is Higgins more involved than we thought? And uh, it was the battle of the size yesterday, lunch lunch box Lally and Auntie Bev, uh, the battle of the size. So uh, we'll get to my presentation in, in a second. But what I want to do is I want to bring up just a small little video, just if has if anybody hasn't seen uh, what the studio is looking right, looking right, looking at this moment right now. Uh, I'll just play this little video for you, give you kind of a little update. So um Obviously, the TV is going to get mounted up on this wall. We have the big desk there. It can take up to four people. And I made kind of a genius move the other day. Um, I had this thought. I'm like, we were struggling with where to put my solo desk. And initially, I had it kitty cornered probably right in this position where we are now. If you look at that room, it was kitty cornered. and just wasn't making sense. So I said, well, why don't I just slide it up to the big table and just make kind of like a T? And it would be a lot easier because I can just sit there, head a table and have everybody to the sides. And it was like that aha moment. And then everything clicked and ended up working out really well. Uh, I'll, I'll finish this video and then we'll get into Karen Reed. But this is what it's looking like in there right now. Uh, we have a couple softbox lights in there. I did some decorating on the ceiling um, and it, it's starting to really pull together. We'll get some things mounted up on the wall, pictures, stuff like that. Um, but I'm super, super happy with the layout now. The ambience light in there is great. Uh, we're going to get a couple of floor lamps where we can control the light just to give it a little bit more light in there because you learn some things. You know, the dark paint looks great, but it absorbs a lot of light. So it's going to need some light in there to kind of brighten it up a little bit. But uh, I have a couple of soft boxes and I just picked up some adjustable lamps. Hopefully that will give it the ambience that we're looking for in there but it's going to be a really great spot i'm excited to get in there and create uh it's been a very long <laughs> tiresome couple of weeks but it's getting there so i want to give everybody an update i hope you're all loving it uh i'm loving it it's starting to actually feel like a, a working studio now and uh you know hopefully we can start getting some real guests in there soon get this thing up and running just in time, uh, hopefully for, for trial. All right, let's get into my presentation. Let's talk about some of the key takeaways from yesterday's hearing, and then we will go through the hearing. Uh, again, I only watch key parts of it, but it's something that I want to go over in totality tonight. So we have uh, Yanetti yesterday dropping the big bombs, the huge bombs, and we hear more about Brian Higgins's potential involvement in this uh, this case. And I, it was very eye-opening to a lot of the things that I heard. I mean, almost mouth-dropping, uh, jaw-dropping uh, on the floor. So let's look at some of the key takeaways from yesterday. So I went through, took some notes, and uh, these are the key takeaways that I came up with. 42 minutes of the Canton PD Sally Port video is missing where Karen's SUV was housed. Higgins was in the Sally Port during the time on the missing video. So another key takeaway I had, we hear, uh, we heard a lot, it's supposed to be heard, I'm sorry. We heard a lot about Colin o Albert's track record of harassing Officer John O'Keefe. Uh, witness Brian Higgins destroys SIM card and phone at a Cape Cod military base after Morsi gives him the order or permission, if you want to say that. Higgins asks FBI friend to only extract text messages between him, Karen, and John, and then he turns over that information to investigators at the Canton PD. Nothing funny about that, right? 
We look at another uh, key takeaway, a bunch of other key takeaways here. Lally lies about what Karen said during her second intake. Brian Albert destroyed his phone. Julie and Chris Albert harassed John by taking taunting photos on his property while John was away on vacation. We had the um well text from Brian to Karen, and that's Brian Higgins to Karen. Higgins and Chief Berkowitz are friends. Some more key t- uh, t- uh, key takeaways. I think this is a double slide. I apologize about that. Uh, let's see. I had a couple uh, double ups here. Julian, Chris Albert, harassed John. We know that. Um, Yanetti calls out Brian Albert for not upholding first responder ethics. I think that is huge. And Yanetti was on fire yesterday. Higgins went to Canton PD and questioned officers involved in the investigation. And that might be it. No, we got another one here. Higgins texts John to try to get him back to 34 Fairview. Jurors will have a Corey check, which is a background check. Uh, Higgins signs a, I think it's called prof- Profery Agreement uh, with the FBI. And I looked that up. And you'll probably hear Melanie talk a little bit more about this tomorrow as she's an attorney. Um, but when I looked it up, it essentially came to the uh, pro for, pro offer agreement or contract is designed to encourage the defendant to speak freely and truthfully about his or her involvement in a criminal conduct or knowledge of crimes committed by others. See, I'm always wondering, with Higgins' involvement, and let's just say hypothetically, Higgins was the one that killed John, could it be that he knew that this was going to get so deep that he gets right to the FBI, talks to them and says, well, I have all this information. I can give you all this information to keep himself clear and point all of the uh, the evidence or all of the heat back on the people inside 34 Fairview. I found that pretty interesting. Why would he be out ahead of the game knowing what he's done? I, I don't know. To me, just... Innocent people, in my in my opinion, don't destroy phones. <laughs> There's something on those phones, especially your SIM card. He destroys the SIM card in his phone. Innocent people don't destroy their phones. Uh, it, it's what do you? I'm just gonna get go. Ah, well, you know, I'm just gonna crack my phone today, and you know, uh, it doesn't happen. If you're involved in something, uh, you would turn your phone over. You would say, "Hey, I am not involved in this." You can have my phone. You can extract my data. I know that you're investigating this. Here, take my phone. But you go way down the cape, decide to take your SIM card out of your phone, smash it to pieces and smash your phone. I don't know. Got a, got a, got a, got a little problem with that. So it's a red flag. Uh, defend, uh, the defense medical examiner and FBI confirmed John's injuries did not happen via Karen's SUV and injuries, not, and injuries are consistent with a fight. And I think that's my, oh, I have one more slide here. Higgins uh, text John. Again, I don't know why I double these up. I apologize that jurors have the Corey check. We already know about that. And um, let's see, Higgins signed. Yeah, more about the uh, Proctor internal investigation is disclosed. We just don't know about that information yet. And Brian Albert lied to where uh, GE looked, supposed to be Higgins, looked at photos where he looked at photos with Higgins. Apologize on my slides. I screwed those up. I threw them together really quick this afternoon. But let's get into the hearing. And I've already gone and fast forward it. So we get right to where the hearing takes place. Let me just pull that up. And we will go through it. So nice to be back. I missed everybody. I really did. I was like jonesing for a stream. All right, let's get into this. Judge 22 CR 47, the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. Can I have counsel identify themselves starting with the Commonwealth? Adam Lally for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Lally. Good morning, Your Honor. Laura McLaughlin for the Commonwealth. Good morning, Ms. McLaughlin. Good morning, Your Honor. Alan Jackson on behalf of Ms. Reed. Good morning, Mr. Jackson. Good morning, Elizabeth Little, also on behalf of Ms. Reed. Good morning, Ms. Little. Good morning, Your Honor. I felt like it was Yanetti's day. I really did. I mean, he really, really shined in this hearing. It was nice to see, uh, you know, kind of that warm up for him going to trial because we've seen a lot of Jackson lately. 
but it was nice to see Unetti get up there and thunder away and um, just, uh, you know, really put it on the record. Thank, Thank you, Unetti Audrey. It's nice to be Good here. Good morning, Mr. Unetti. You. Good morning, Mr. Unetti. a while. Reed. Nice to have everyone right. here. So... I apologize. I screwed my slides up. I thought I had it down on point, but I had a lot of repetitive information in there, but we got through it. We got through it. I'm a little rusty. I'm a little, 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 little rusty. <laughs> to begin... And I have all the motions in limine. Um, I'll talk about how exactly we'll go through them in a minute. Um, but first, so in reviewing the motions in limine, I mean, clearly the defendant has an absolute right, a constitutional right, to present a third party culprit defense, but counsel is well aware that that is not without limit right from the case law now defendant has stood here defense counsel has stood in this court repeatedly um stood here and in other venues and in the pleadings espousing various third-party culprit um theories I, I thought it was very interesting with this too this third-party culprit um you know where bev kind of challenged yanetti and yanetti fired back and said look you know it's not our job to prove who killed John O'Keefe. That is the Commonwealth's job. Our job is to defend. Our job is to respond. And I found that to be a very interesting back and forth. Or scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, but now that it's time really to actually try the case in the courtroom, I, I don't have a motion here. from the defense Thanks to admit the party culprit. Mary. Uh, testimony. So, and as you're well aware, I have to make findings before any third party, any mention of any third party culprit evidence or even an opening goes before Thank the jurors. Appreciate you being here. Um, you know, in order to admit it, and given that I have no information at all, I mean, I don't know who the third party culprit is, even after reading 4,500 pages of discovery. I don't know what motive. A, a third party culprit might have. I don't know how it's relevant. I don't know if it's remote or if it's current. I don't know if it's speculative um, or blinded by the light. <laughs> or if it's relevant. I don't know if it will prejudice uh, or confuse the jury. And if it's hearsay, I have a whole other series of factors I have to consider. So, Mr. Yanetti, are you pursuing a third party culprit defense? Uh, we are, Your Honor, and I'm prepared to address that. The Commonwealth has raised the issue, and I am prepared to address that today. So you filed your motions first, and you did not raise it. So if the Commonwealth had not raised it, you did not move to introduce it, correct? I have no motion from. No, I from understand. You about it. I understand, Your Honor. Um, if you'd like something in writing for us, we can do that. I have a full argument prepared. All right. So who is the third party? Culprit? I'm going to tell you, this is going to be a, a very, um, it's going to be a battle. It's going to be a battle of the attorneys with this judge. Absolutely. She is not going to make it easy for anybody. You're going to make it easy for the Commonwealth, but for Karen's defense team, there's going to be a lot of back and forth, a lot of fighting. Culprit. We are under no obligation to name any specific third party culprit. How am I supposed to? So you're prepared to argue all this? I'm prepared to argue it, Judge. All right, so we Men. will get to that when we get to Thank the Commonwealth Commission. That's fine. Now, the, the second thing I want to address, because again, it's, it's very important at this point um, the motion regarding the DNA, regarding. Um, excluding the DNA. Mr. Lally, why should I not allow that motion? Uh, for a couple of reasons, Your Honor. Um, number the one, judge, uh, what I can... The judge, in my opinion, should excuse herself. I mean, she knows a lot of these people involved in this. She knows a lot of the people on the Commonwealth side, the Albert, the McAlberts. She knows a lot of them. Should uh, provide to the court by way of update is um, that most of the testing uh, with regard to that item is complete. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, the item is is hair uh, that was confirmed by the, the Bodhi uh, testing uh, prior to them conducting any sort of mitochondrial testing. The mitochondrial profile, uh, the partial profile that was generated in regard to the hair sample uh, is complete. 
the mitochondrial DNA profile in regard to Mr. O'Keefe's sample is complete. Uh, the preliminary analysis uh, that I received uh, by way of uh, email from Bodhi yesterday uh, indicated that they were consistent with each other. Uh, I asked for some sort of preliminary report or something that I could share with council uh, based on their uh, labs accreditation. Uh, that does not permit them to release anything by way of a report prior to it going through a full review process. My understanding is that not only that process, but the entire uh, lab file uh, should be produced uh, by Tuesday. On top of that, uh, what I would uh, state as far as <clears throat> any sort of prejudice uh, the defendant of ears that they've suffered as a result of that, uh, there is still zero reciprocal discovery that I've received uh, in regard to anything from counsel. And then part of the delay, at least a portion of, of the delay in this specific testing, as the court is aware, uh, as you've had a chance to review uh, Bodhi Technologies uh, observance policy as far as outside experts, there was a significant delay in hearing from counsel and, uh, for the defendant in regard to whether or not they wish to have someone present prior. How long a delay? I uh, believe it was at least several weeks, if not a month. I mean, we spoke about it in person in December, uh, and I don't believe that My I- My order was in November. Correct. So when we received uh, the, it was, took a, your order was in November. What took a little time on our part was to get uh, the samples taken from the troopers in regard to the other testing and in order to get all of those items shipped and transported from the MSPCL to Lorton, Virginia to Bodie. When was that done? Uh, late November. Go ahead. And then there was uh, a evidence viewing, uh, which both counsel uh, attended. We spoke about it there. I think that was December 1st. Uh, and then I waited a few weeks, never heard back, followed up on it, and eventually heard uh, back with regard to them not wishing to have anybody present for that. When was that? I, I don't have a specific date offhand, but... I need you to find it. I can. All right, so I didn't know that the defendant decided not to have somebody there. Right. And that prolonged it. They weren't able to go forward, right? Yes. How long will it take you to find that information? Um, shouldn't take too long. I just, I, I would need to check my email. All right, I'm gonna take a five minute recess. Thank you. Obviously, we'll speed up to the recess. You are unmuted. Here we go. What are you handing me, Mr. Lally? No, it's an email uh, from Mr. Yanetti on December 22nd uh, confirming that they uh, do not wish to have observation for testing in the hair sample of Bodie. All right, so that was about a month after my order? Correct. All right. And the defendant's asking me to exclude this in part because of the late disclosure of the information. Yes. All right, uh, I'll hear from the defense on this, and then I'll give you an opportunity to address it, Mr. Lally. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. I'd first like to address the timeline that Mr. Lally has just explained to the court. First of all, we were not all made right. aware that we were allowed to test based on Bodie's protocols and procedures until December 1st. We were given a letter saying it would cost $21,000 for our expert to sit in on that test. Lally gets caught here, right? Lally gets caught. I, I think I remember this. This is one of the, uh, the lies. We... We reviewed that letter. We told Lally, the, Mr. Lally, that it was most likely we were not going to have Lally. someone independently <clears throat> watch the testing because of the price. When was that? December 1st. When? December 1st? On December 1st. Okay. We confirmed that in writing when he emailed us again on December 22nd. And I would note for the court that Bodhi did not receive the hair from the Commonwealth until January 11th. Okay. So there was no delay on our part. As the court knows, to date we have received no reports from the Commonwealth regarding Bodhi Technologies analysis of the DNA. The Commonwealth has engaged in repeated and inexcusable delays 
regarding the testing of this particular item of evidence, which at this point is sanctionable. The hair has been in law enforcement custody for more than two years, two years. Your Honor. Yeah. On February 1st, 2022, Massachusetts State Police criminalist Maureen Hartnett purportedly recovered a hair from the bumper of Ms. Reed's vehicle. For a full year, the Commonwealth did nothing. Finally, on March 6, 2023, criminalist Maureen Hartnett got around for the first time. Sorry, criminalist department. Is that what you said? Criminalist Maureen Hartnett. Okay, yes. Got around to conducting a visual inspection of that hair for the very first time. On March 6, 2023, she opined that it appeared to be human. However, subsequent discovery produced by the Commonwealth revealed that she had failed her proficiency test in that precise subject matter only one month prior. Then on August 25th, 2023, the Commonwealth submitted that hair to the Massachusetts State Police Lab for DNA testing. And it was forensically determined that no human DNA was detected. Almost six months later, the Commonwealth made I like watching the galley. I like just watching everybody's heads on Karen's side. It's so good. The third attempt to find Let me it. get to this really quick. Uh, Annie, thank you so much for becoming a YouTube member. I appreciate the support. You have access to all my members' only content. Uh, if you're just first here, time on the channel, I'm actively building out a studio, and I've been doing members-only lives from that studio so you, you can get updates as we go along. But thank you. I appreciate the support. I really do. All right, here we go. We'll keep playing through. Evidence establishing that the hair was somehow probative in this case. It is now four days before trial, and we are told that we're going to receive this on the day trial is set to begin. Pursuant to Massachusetts Rule of Criminal Procedure 14C, subdivisions one and two, the court has the discretion to exclude evidence based on the Commonwealth's failure to comply with its discovery obligations. There's no excuse for a two-year delay. We immediately conferred with counsel when he notified us as to what the requirements were going to be if we decided to have an expert present for testing. We got back to him the day that he emailed us following up about that. And they didn't even bother sending the hair to the lab until weeks later. The breathing. So I don't think it's fair to blame the defense for a two-year delay in this regard. As the court may know from the notices of discovery, we've received an overwhelming amount of evidence. This week, last week, the week before that, we're on the eve of trial. It is not fair to throw at us yet another item of evidence that we have to retain an expert to assess. We have to review, we have to make tactical decisions. That's not a fair position to put the defense in. We've been asking for a continuance. I think the only fair thing if the court is going to force us to go to trial is to exclude this evidence. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Lally. Yes, Your Honor, again, um, it, not faulting counsel for any sort of two-year delay period, but there was a, a period of time, uh, given sort of the close nature of, of when the Commonwealth is receiving this information, uh, that a couple weeks, uh, or a few weeks in this case, uh, do matter. Uh, the other point uh, I would make as far as, uh, again, as far as the defendant being prejudiced, this is an evidence that I... A few weeks matter? Dude, it took two years, two years. You're trying to say that it was delayed because there was a couple of weeks that were just, um, that were a couple of weeks that were delayed. So it took two years to get this information. That actually, actually makes no sense. Anticipate introducing in, in the first day, the first week, or probably not even the first month of, of trial. So uh, whatever time counsel needs uh, in order to uh, retain an expert, run that by an expert, run that by one of their experts they already have. Uh, I, I don't know that, whether or not they have any experts, because again, I don't have anything from them. Um, so as far as uh, ample time, uh, I, I would submit uh, that there's more than sufficient nice time everybody. Uh, once Thank the you for report coming is received uh, for counsel to make uh, use of it in whichever way they deem appropriate. Uh, and for that reason, and I'm Welcome certainly not in. asking the court to continue the trial date, uh, but for that reason, I would ask that the motion to exclude be denied. Um, absent any prejudice to the defendant. All right, so I, I'm going to take this under advisement. Uh, and I, I may as well tell you that the best way 
I think for us to proceed with the rest of these motions is since because they were filed so late, which I understand they were filed, just to be clear, I know they were filed by the deadlines, but uh, so close to trial, uh, I don't have written oppositions, really, unless you both raised uh, independently the same issue. So what I will do this morning is my intention is to hear um, from You're supposed to be partying, not watching me. <laughs> My girlfriend's at Foxwood. She's celebrating a, a friend's birthday this evening. She's going to stay up there and hang out. So to hear at least <clears throat> from the other side, if, um, if the yeah, motion itself is clear it. enough, but to hear from counsel, um, then we'll take a break Welcome and in. at two o'clock we'll come back and anything I can decide because I know you're preparing this weekend to go to trial on Tuesday. Anything I can decide by this afternoon, I will. Anything that I cannot, I will let you know. Um, and then um, then we'll do housekeeping, which I can, um, including, though it's certainly a very important part of the case, jury voir dire in that. So that will come at the end of that will come this afternoon. So uh, starting with the view. Um, uh, Your Honor, I was just going to notify the court uh, to your discretion. There are a number of motions <laughs> Thanks, that will Jimmy. be unopposed. I don't Appreciate know All right, so what I'm going to do with that is the Commonwealth filed a very helpful list of what their um, numbers. We have, of course, the, the paper number, the docketed number. Uh, so when I get to that, we'll just go through those quickly. Whoever the court wishes. All right, I appreciate that. So, so you, well, I'm probably starting with one. You could have saved yourselves time in writing the motion regarding the view because you both want a view. I will conduct a view. Um, you need to talk because you have different locations. Yeah, and you know, we've, uh, upon consideration, Your Honor, the Commonwealth has asked for a view of 34 Fairview Road. Um, we would be satisfied with a view of so you don't need to go to the waterfall we, we, I, I think that we can just agree to go to that one location wow all right so you all figure out the view i am going to take under advisement your request so they want to go to 34 fairview interesting hmm very very interesting it would make sense walk the scene let's get through it let's check it out <clears throat> interesting best um, of the defendant coming with us. You know that there are all sorts of things I have to consider sure. before deciding that. Thank okay? you. So that part is under advisement. Um, before the end of today, figure out exactly what you want to do with the view. Um, Mr. Lally, your office will provide state police escort for that view? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Now, our court officers, Chief Rose usually gets the bus. So. All right, so for that, so the defendant's motion, it's our paper 283, defendant's motion eliminate to exclude irrelevant, inadmissible, and prejudicial prior bad. From my understanding, the rumors that I've heard that they want to be just as very helpful to this case as they can, and um, that's what I've heard character and propensity evidence. So I'll hear whoever's arguing that for the common, the Aruba incident, if you will. I hope so, Massacre. I mean, I'm sorry, who, who's arguing for the defense? That's who I'll hear from. I am, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. I think they want the jury. I think the defense wants the jury to go there. Absolutely, 100%, they want the jury to go there and see everything um, that is the impossibility of this. They want them to go walk and see that road. I've been on that road a million times in front of that house. The curved road going up on about a 30 degree grade where they're saying that Karen backed up 62 feet at what, 24.2 miles an hour in the snow, did this wild turn and accurately just hit John and John goes flying back on the lawn, you know, almost six feet in the air. It's, it's impossible absolutely impossible you say 282 283 oh this is all backwards Pauline did this for me all right thank i you. believe so sj because the jury will be pulling thank you, your honor the commonwealth seeks to admit irrelevant inadmissible and prejudicial prior bad character and propensity evidence against ms reed by admitting inflammatory evidence of an event that purportedly transpired in aruba on december 31st 2021 
As the court knows, this type of propensity evidence is extraordinarily prejudicial and serves no purpose other than to assassinate Ms. Reed's character in the eyes of the jury. The Commonwealth has put forth no reliable evidence to suggest that the incident that occurred in Aruba on New Year's Eve has anything whatsoever to do with O'Keefe's death or that this remote and isolated incident was even a point of contention in their relationship at the time in question. And we aren't left guessing, Your Honor. All of the witnesses who were present at the Waterfall Bar and Grill on January 29th, 2022, along with high quality video surveillance footage from that night, established that Ms. Reed and Mr. O'Keefe were happy, they were in good spirits, they were getting along. There is no evidence to suggest that this incident had anything to do with the facts at issue in this case. The Commonwealth points to purported angry voicemails left on the, defendant's, the decedent's voicemail to suggest that there was some sort of hostile relationship between Ms. Reed and Mr. O'Keefe that night. However, these voicemails were left after Ms. Reed dropped O'Keefe off at Brian Albert's residence and after he failed back to come back outside to meet her. There is no logical relationship between the prior bad acts evidence in this case that the Commonwealth seeks to admit and the crime charged here. And therefore, this evidence must be excluded. Okay, come on. Thank you, Ghost. Yes, Your Honor. So this also relates to uh, Commonwealth's motion in limine number 20. Yes. Um, so in regard to that, Your Honor, <clears throat> this is uh, highly relevant evidence as it pertains to motive and as it pertains to the nature of the relationship between Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed, uh, which uh, goes to motive, it goes to absence of accident, goes to motive, uh, as, excuse me, absence of mistake. Uh, and this is not a, um, as the defendant seems to uh, continuously try to pose it as, as some sort of temporary or isolated uh, incident. This isn't just <clears throat> the argument uh, or the yelling uh, of swears between uh, the defendant and uh, Ms. Sullivan in the lobby in Aruba. This then leads to an argument which uh, both children indicate in their statements uh, continued inside the room in front of them for about 20 minutes after it happened. This is also not a fleeting reference in the sense that the defendant continuously brings it up on her own. Um, specifically in text communications uh, with Mr. Higgins uh, when she's talking about uh, the nature of their relationship. And it's not just the voicemails that the defendant leaves on Mr. O'Keefe. See, what the Commonwealth is trying to paint a picture is that Karen was very, very upset at John. They're going to they're gonna paint this picture that Karen didn't want to live with John anymore. Karen didn't want to be around John anymore. She's out flirting with other men. She's, uh, she's uh, you know, kissing on other guys. She didn't want him in his life. She didn't want him in her life. So she's a bad person. And that's, what, that's how they're going to paint Karen in this. And that she got so mad that she didn't know how to get out of this relationship. And all the possible infidelity that they had between both of them. That she was so pissed off that she just got angry that night. And, and ran John over. That's how they're going to paint this. That's how they're going to paint this. I'm telling you right now. But on the flip side, normal couples fight. Everybody has probably fought with their spouse, their loved one, a lover, whoever they may be. That shit happens in relationships. It happens. You agree. You disagree. That's what happens. But they're going to try to spin all this stuff, I mean, and spin it and say, oh, well, look at the text messages she had, to, you know, said to John, oh, I hate you or I'm angry at you or, or whatever it may be. And then she's she's texting her friends about their relationship. Oh, he's being a son of a bitch, blah, blah, blah. They're going to pull all that stuff out and try to make it look like Karen was this crazy woman that wanted to get rid of John and get him out of her life. And I'm guaranteed they're going to probably try to spin it and say she wanted to float right into Higgins' arms. I'm telling you, that's the way that they're going to do this. I think it's it's a bad tactic, and I think it's going to open a lot up. Because once those witnesses get on the stand, I'm telling you right now, they're going to get shredded by Karen's defense team. His phone 
after uh, the murder occurs in front of 34 Fairview. It's also uh, text messages exchanged between the two of them in the days leading up to that, uh, in which they discuss the nature of their relationship. You also have statements from the children, which indicate that the victim had tried- See how he's pouring it on right now? He's just pouring it on, pouring it on, pouring it on. He's trying to build this thing like Karen is this crazy woman that wanted to kill John, wanted her out of life, didn't know how to do it, but the, she seized the opportunity that night. I'm telling you. To break up with the defendant it's multiple pretty weak. times in front of them, asked her to leave the home Theory. and she refused. You also have a text communication from Mr. O'Keefe to Ms. Reed in which he indicates that he thinks that their relationship is essentially- What was the course. date of that one? I believe that was the 28th. Uh, then there's an, other text messages uh, from the defendant to Mr. O'Keefe uh, referring to their relationship uh, as, between themselves and with the children as toxic. Um, <clears throat> these are further statements regarding infidelity, which continue on to the morning of, uh, in, in which statements that she makes uh, in the backseat of the vehicle with Ms. McCabe and Ms. Roberts as they're looking uh, for Mr. Yeah, O'Keefe. Yeah, he's pouring it on. Uh, just prior to, uh, to locating his body on the front lawn of 34 Verfew. Um, these are statements <clears throat> regarding uh, her belief uh, of Mr. O'Keefe's infidelity that she repeats again when she's uh, having her recorded interview with Ms. Voss from Boston Magazine. Um, these are not... This is, I'm telling you, this is the only angle they have. This is the only angle the Commonwealth has because it just logically makes no sense. It, it, none, of the, none of the facts that they've brought forward make no sense. So now they're going to hang on to this knowing that they're going to tri trial. I'm telling you, this is the angle that Lally's going to use, the ang angle Commonwealth's going to use. Uh, but trust me, you can, you can hear it now. He's pouring it all on. And he's going to sit in front of that jury and say, she was an angry lover. She was pissed off at John. Here's the text messages. The children made the statement. They're probably going to try to pull these kids up on the witness stand. I'm telling you, that's what they're going to try to do. It's not going to fly with a jury. There's nothing that sticks there. Normal couples fight. They have disagreements. They have arguments. I, I don't know about Karen Reed's relationships. I don't give a shit about Karen Reed's relationship. But I'm going to tell you right now, she didn't kill Officer John O'Keefe. Absolutely, 100% did not do it. Isolated statements. These are not... Uh just one time four weeks prior it's not too remote in time and it does show sort of the nature of the relationship and as it's evolving over the course of that month from the date of of the incident in aruba all the way through until the date uh that mr o'keefe uh, is killed in furtherance of that also there are statements that the defendant makes to paramedics when she's being treated on scene uh that the He's last never... time that she saw Mr. O'Keefe, they got into a fight or an argument. And she's what? upset because that's the last time that they spoke was during the course of a fight or an argument in front of the house on Fairview Road. Uh, so it literally continues from the Aruba incident all the way through uh, to the murder's occurrence. Uh, so for those reasons, the Commonwealth would submit uh, that it is relevant as to motive. It is relevant as to absence uh, the weakest uh, accident, case. and it is relevant as to absence of mistake. Thank you. All right. Yeah, listen, you know, maybe they had a rocky relationship. I don't care. I don't care. You know, uh, maybe that's the type of relationship they were in. Really don't care. Doesn't make her a murderer. Big deal. She argued with her, her, her lover. So what? But see how he's like, oh, you know, the argument in Aruba, they had a witness there, that witness. So they're going to use that and spin this tale. Oh, it continued. It started at Aruba and continued all the way up to the murder, all the way up to the murder. They were just fighting. She couldn't stand them. Ah, that's what they're going to paint. That's the picture um, they're trying to paint. What I will need is exactly what the Commonwealth intends Seriously. to introduce. I think you've outlined it and I'm familiar with it. Jessica says, too effing bad, too bad. Nobody's perfect. I fight with my husband. I never, I'd never kill my husband. I just say it and I'm in a bad mood, of course, but I would never kill him. Uh, he, here oh my god never absolutely absolutely um couple fight if, if it, yeah if right i admitted it, it would certainly be accompanied by very strong curative instructions which you know is my right uh i've heard argument now i'm going to think about this and maybe decide it by this afternoon but okay. thank you okay all right so you were both in agreement on what's the defendant's motion to exclude irrelevant and prejudicial evidence regarding alleged harassment and or intimidation of a witness. 
and the Commonwealth for different grounds and different scope actually. Motion to exclude mention of Aiden Kearney, AKA Turtle Boy and his pending criminal charges for witness intimidation. So though you both agree it's out, that doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with you that it should be out. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that the nature of her the harassment, um, mindful of the grand jury minutes that I've read that in response to some of the questions posed by uh, those at the U.S. Attorney's Office, the answers explained away some conduct as a result of the extraordinary harassment witnesses were undergoing. So I'm not sure I agree with you. So go ahead and, and try and persuade me, but um, what I'm inclined to do is keep it out in the case in chief, but uh, Commonwealth said you, you know, told your witnesses not to discuss it. So I'll, I'll hear the defendant. Jackson, right? I think Jackson gets up now. I guess I would start, Your Honor, by saying that um, in order for evidence to come in, it has to be elicited by a party. It has to be offered by a party. Um, you're being told that the Commonwealth does not intend to elicit this evidence and that the defense does not intend to elicit this evidence. Right. So Why I the question that I would direct to the court is, do you intend to follow up with questions? I'm not questioning the jury. It's clear that it may be a response, a natural response by a witness that neither one of you intended to get as a reason for something, right. that I'm not going to sanction the witness because I allowed the Commonwealth's motion. Sure. Uh, so, so, Mr. Yannetti, yes. so it's clearly you try your case the way you want to try your case, and the Commonwealth decides how they want to do it, but I am not tying the hands of witnesses to natural responses to questions. So I'm taking this under advisement. If you open the door, it comes in. Oh, I completely understand that, Your Honor. Um, I, I will say that I think probably, I don't want to speak for Mr. Lally, but I think- So don't speak for Mr. Lally. I'll, I'll, speak, for him for, I'll speak for myself then, if the court will allow me, uh, which is that, uh, if, if a, uh, a witness opens the door to uh, you know, a further explanation of this, um, that could give rise to both sides right. exploring that, which you know, I, I suppose uh, we'll deal with that when it comes, it comes right. to it. The way the motion's written, it would be prohibited and witnesses, you know, I'm not tying the hands of witnesses to natural answers that are the result of questions asked by counsel. Right, understood. Okay. Do you understand that, Mr. Lally? Oh, absolutely, Your Honor. And, and that was not my intent. As, as if, if How the question, motion reads, Mr. Your motion reads, Mr. Lally. I understand. Uh, but it, it was more of a uh, notice that, that the Commonwealth doesn't seek to introduce any evidence of that. But at the same time, obviously, if the, if the truthful and honest answer to a question that's posed of a witness references that, then, then I think it, it comes in. All right. So I think we're all on the same page. Neither of you intends to introduce this in your cases, but if you open the door or if it's a natural response from a witness, it comes in. Well, so they're essentially saying the turtle boy stuff, the witness intimidation, if they get a witness on there and the witness brings it up, they're going to allow it to be brought into this trial. How wouldn't you know that Lally wouldn't coach any of the witnesses for the Commonwealth to slide that into their statement? Let's just say the defense wants to leave that out, wants to leave Aiden's whole whole uh, part in this out. All the Commonwealth has to do is get up there and tell a witness, why don't you talk about that while we're on the stand? We'll slide that in there and then it has to get brought in. Am I, am I getting that? I think that's what could happen here. Exactly. Okay. All right. So, Jim, is 289 defendant's motion eliminated to exclude the plasma, serum plasma, the blood, the alcohol testing? 
But if a witness brings it in, if a witness brings it in, then they're going to have to bring talk about it. If that's what my understanding of this is. My number's all off. That's 289. Yeah. All right. And the Commonwealth has a, a, a paragraph or two responding in one of your other motions. So I will hear the defendant on the motion regarding the testing of the blood from the hospital for the alcohol levels. This is Jackson, I think. Yep. Thank you, Your Honor. I'll be addressing more, this more um, with, the court, with the court's permission. Um, this is number, just so we keep it clear in my head, I, I had named this number 17, dealing with the retrograde extrapolation. Okay, we don't have it as 17 anywhere. I yeah, I the, agree, the Tyrone. That the, the helpful list that the Commonwealth... Oh, okay, so, it's, so the, I, right. uh, our number is 289. Right. Okay. So, and the Commonwealth's one paragraph response is <clears throat> seventeen. But you filed the motion, so why don't we hear from you as the moving party? Thank you. Um, so, the Commonwealth wishes to have Miss Reed's retrograde extrapolation records admitted over naturally a hearsay objection, because the Commonwealth, their position is that they are medical records. The Commonwealth misapprehends the definition, the base definition of what a medical record is. A medical record, as the court well knows, holds a very special place in the evidence code, and that's because it's not compiled in anticipation of litigation. And for that reason and that reason only, um, they're deemed non-testimonial and, and not subject to Craw uh, Crawford and the defendant's right to confront and cross-examine witnesses or the experts behind the reports. Medical records are different than what we have here. The extrapolation records we have here are not medical records that were generated for treatment or Ms. Reed's medical history. They're the opposite. Those records were generated specifically in anticipation of litigation and in association with this criminal investigation. Thus, they are rank hearsay. The Commonwealth claims that the records are not produced in anticipation of litigation, stating basically uh, that during her hospitalization, law enforcement was at the, quote, beginning stages of their investigation. Um, but what the Commonwealth fails to mention or address is that at approximately 6.30 a.m. Mm. on a dash cam video, an officer, Officer Good, as a matter of fact, a Canton police officer, states to Detective Lank that he is going to, quote, unquote, section her which the court knows what that phrase means. He's going to place a hold on her medically. Thus, the clear intent of law enforcement hours before the blood draw was actually taken was to keep her under law enforcement's thumb as she was an immediate suspect. But there's a bigger issue, Your Honor, and that is that the parties lack the essential, both, and by the way, this goes to the Commonwealth as well, the Commonwealth, but more importantly, the defense, we all lack the essential information on how the blood was actually drawn and tested. Those standardized protocols that we all get used to in the average OUI case, drunk driving case, uh, they don't exist here. Uh, the standardized protocols for reliable testing, they're tried and true, and every one of those protocols is missing or, or are missing, and that leaves the defense having to sort of guess at the validity of the underlying test and the validity of the underlying test is the foundation on which the extrapolation is made, which is the only thing the Commonwealth really cares about. They don't care about the underlying test, they care about extrapolating backward several hours. But that this sort of goes along the, the, the theme of garbage in, garbage out. If the underlying test was not valid, or it can't be proven to be valid, then of course the extrapolation is also invalid. Hmm. Uh, the question remaining is, was the testing done by gas chromatography? Was it enzymatic testing? We don't know and we'll never find out. We don't have reports to suggest that uh, or exactly what the validity of those tests were. So the initial result is suspect and by extension, the extrapolation is also suspect. It, it bears pointing out, Your Honor, and this is the only sort of granular detail I want to get into, the extrapolation, according to the Commonwealth's expert, is somewhere between 0.13 and 0.29 blood alcohol concentration. That is a swing of more than 123%. In other words, the swing of the extrapolation is larger than any one of the numbers themselves, which means uh, 
it can't be, it, it simply cannot be reliable. It illustrates the invalidity of the underlying serum plasma test. And for those reasons, the defense objects to the admission of both the blood test, the underlying test, as well as the concomitant extrapolation. Thank okay, you. thank you. Come on. Your Honor, so what the Commonwealth would submit is this may have been a valid ba basis for a motion to suppress, but it was a motion to, to suppress that was never filed and one that the defendant specifically waived, uh, that Mr. Yannetti waived all uh, motions to suppress. As it pertains to uh, Mr. Roberts from the Office of Alcohol Testing's testimony regarding the serum conversion and the retrograde extrapolation, the reason for the range is because it's math and, and essentially taking into <laughs> account a number of uh, different variables. Uh, that is why the range is as it is as it pertains to the um the specific item that would be introduced in the evidence meaning the defendant's medical records that's what the commonwealth is referring to as the records uh, coming in mr roberts would come in and testify as to his own uh, analysis his mathematical calculations and the results based on his training and experience which the defendant has had for over two years as Mr. Roberts testified at the grand jury to that exact uh, set of scenarios. As it pertains to the testing itself, the Commonwealth, uh, as indicated on its proposed final pretrial memorandum, has summoned in not only uh, the doctor who ordered the testing, the registered nurse, uh, the nurse practitioner, uh, who would both have been involved in the uh, taking of the sample from the defendant pursuant to uh, her medical treatment and medical diagnoses as well as the director of the lab uh, at Good Samaritan Medical Center who would testify as to uh, what kind of testing is done and the nature of that testing and everything else. As it pertains to those witnesses, if the defendant wishes to conduct some sort of voir dire prior to the testimony in front of the jury, I certainly have no objection to that. Uh, but any sort of voir dire of Mr. Roberts or exclusion of his testimony uh, would be inappropriate based on the fact that uh, the defendant has had more than ample notice uh, as to what the parameters of that testimony would be. Uh, so as far as what would be coming in as an exhibit, uh, it would be the medical records with that uh, amount in it. And then it would be testimony from essentially anyone and everyone involved uh, in the ordering, taking and analyzing uh, of that particular sample, which then provides the basis for Mr. Roberts' testimony. Okay. So I have like one small paragraph from the Commonwealth on this. I want a memo on this. Sure. All right, so I'll take this under advisement. More yes. under advisements. Yeah, um, there's 17. We still need to address. Lally's cleaning. <clears throat> all right. So that's all of the defendants' motions and limine, correct, Mr. Giannetti? <laughs> Let me just have a moment. Mr. Jackson, it's all of them, isn't it? We, we well, no, we, we filed a motion for attorney conducted panel of voir dire. Yeah, that's a joint motion, and that's what I already said we're going to talk about impanelment this afternoon. Just being complete in answer to the court's question. That okay. was one that was not addressed, but that's fine. All right. Oh, the, the request just to have panel. Your motion was a little bit confusing. Right. So you just, you want panel of voir dire? Panel of voir dire, correct. I, I'm not going to do panel of voir dire in this case. So we'll talk about the particulars of it um, later this afternoon. All right, so on the Commonwealth's list of motions, you said that there are some that you may agree with. What besides the view? Are there any of these numbers? Who's? Yes, Your Honor. Um, the defense does not object to the Commonwealth's motions in limine numbers one through six. Um, number right, eight. One through six. Yes, number eight. Number nine, number 11, we obviously joined in that request. Yes. Um, let's see. Number 14, we do not object to. Number 15, we have no objection in principle, but we, we do reserve the right to object right to individual exhibits as they, they come. Yeah. Uh, number 18, we have no objection. Number 19, we have no objection. Number 23, no objection. Number 26, no objection. I, I believe that's the, court that's did the one we addressed that. yet. And number 32, we have no objection. All right, thank you. 
All right, Mr. Lally, I will hear you on our paper 297, your number seven. So, Your Honor, this is the Commonwealth's motion to preclude reference and redact the manner of death contained on the victim's death certificate. Uh, this is a, a routine motion uh, the Commonwealth files in, in really respect to any case. Uh, manner of death. That's is, not persuasive, so go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I'm just, it, manner of death, uh, as, as uh, elucidated in the motion, is not something um, that is typically something uh, that is permissible to be testified to uh, from anybody to the jury because that's sort of the question of, of liability uh, ultimately that is left to their uh, discretion um, as far as how they find the facts. But cause of death obviously is something that is a medical determination. Manner of death, as the court is well aware, is uh, there are essentially three or four different uh, selections and they fall into different categories. They don't necessarily mean in the medical context uh, what they might mean in the legal context. Uh, so for that just sort of simple differentiation of, of meaning between the two, uh, manner of death is not something that the Commonwealth feels is appropriate for the court, uh, for any witness to be uh, testifying to uh, as far as the jury is concerned as that's a question uh, for them ultimately to determine. And for those reasons, the Commonwealth would ask that this motion be allowed. All right, who's responding to this? Thank you, Your Honor. The medical examiner who completed the death certificate in this case concluded that the manner of death was undetermined. This is important. I remember this. I remember watching this. This is a very important point that uh, Liz makes here. The Commonwealth now seeks to have that portion of the death certificate redacted because it is quite clearly exculpatory. All of the cases cited by the Commonwealth deal with the issue of whether it was error for the Commonwealth to admit a death certificate listing the manner of death as a homicide because it violates a defendant's right to due process and a fair trial under the 5th, 16th, and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitutions. None of the cases cited by the Commonwealth stand for the proposition that a medical examiner's determination that the manner of death is undetermined should be redacted. In fact, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Ellis at 373 Mass 1, it's a 1977 case, for the proposition that excluding the word undetermined is the better and safer course. But that's in the statement of the law, and I would urge the court to read the Supreme Judicial Court's opinion in that case. What it actually says is this, quote, nothing contained in the record of a death which has reference to the question of liability for causing death shall be admissible in evidence. The better and safer course is to exclude from a death certificate the words homicide, mm. suicide, or accident in a criminal trial. Notably missing from that list of words that the Supreme Judicial Court warned about is the word undetermined. That is what the Commonwealth seeks to have redacted here. The Commonwealth bears the burden of proof in this case. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a homicide occurred, and their own medical examiner has opined that she yeah, is right. unable to it's make that determination. Point. That finding is relevant, it's exculpatory, and there's no authority that supports its redaction. Thank yeah. you. All right. right. Mr. Lally, the medical examiner will be on your witness list, right? I haven't seen either of yours witness list. Yeah, sure. Okay. So I'll take this under advisement. Again, under advisement. <laughs> All right, Mr. Lally, your number 10. Well, the Our number 300. Oh. <laughs> Imagine he's just at home like, bah! just puffing butts. Bah! <laughs> His hair's falling out by the minute. Yes, Your Honor. In this motion, the Commonwealth is uh, simply seeking to uh, obtain Corey information or records of potential jurors, um, not looking for uh, information check. pertaining to uh, jurors that as they come in or some voluminous amount uh, of every possible potential juror, but only seated jurors. Um, and essentially, what the Commonwealth is requesting uh, is to uh, simply have some sort of verification that the answers that are provided by the jurors are uh, true and accurate. Um, 
this is something that is permitted by the case law, it's permitted by the statute, uh, and it's obviously something that the Commonwealth would share with the defense as required to, um, but the timing of it, of, of what I'm asking for and the limited scope uh, that I'm asking for in relation to uh, just seated jurors once we have a full sort of uh, yes, set of jurors, whether that be 12, 16, whatever the, whatever the court uh, chooses. As far Can you imagine what Jackson's going to do to that ME? And they're on the stand. He's going to shred them. As far as the number, I'm I'm assuming approximately 16 or so. Um, but once those are seated, the Commonwealth is just asking for some time to uh, to run those quarries and provide those uh, to counsel, and then make any further objections uh, for cause prior to the jury being sworn. Okay. So I, I know you're not in agreement. Are you opposing this? Yes, Your Honor. Can you all just do me a favor, please? I would appreciate it. Super, super easy. It's about 342 people watching now. We only got about 168 likes. Smash that like button, please. Super easy. It takes two seconds. Just click that little thumbs up. That helps get this stream out into the algorithm. I appreciate it. All right, let's keep playing on here. Thanks for all being here. I appreciate it. Now, Yanetti is going to shine. Uh, first... Uh, the jurors are given a questionnaire which specifically asks this question. Um, they self-report. We rely on self-reporting from jurors with regard to all questions. The Commonwealth has cherry-picked this it. one question to verify whether or not they're telling the truth without dealing with any of the other questions that the <clears throat> jurors are asked. Um, this proceeding right now, like many of these proceedings, is being broadcast widely, publicly. There are potential jurors out now uh, listening to this, I'm sure, uh, waiting for an answer from the court as to whether or not they will undergo that further invasion of privacy. Uh, and they are also, I would submit, aware that in this unusual case, the Commonwealth uh, through their special prosecutor, has sought to charge uh, picketers, protesters, in a very unusual uh, manner. Uh, we would claim a, a harassing manner. Uh, and our position is that this is just another method of harassment. We believe it's unfair. We ask the court to deny Thank this motion. Do you it. have any case law to support your argument, Mr. Unetti? Uh, Your Honor, I... The, 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 Case law is, is simply the constitutional rights to uh, privacy that the jurors have. I mean, uh, yeah. this is it's an issue of, of uh, fairness, Judge. So that's what we're relying on. All right. So the motion is allowed, Mr. Clerk, number 300. Thank you. All right, Mr. Lally, you're coming into number 12 with me quite skeptical. Number 12, leading questions for 13 and 16 year olds. And again, Your Honor, um, let me just first start by saying I don't think that this is something that's going to be absolutely necessary, um, given what I know of, of the two uh, child witnesses in this case, um, only filing under abundance of caution, um, more so should um, the need arise based on less so the age of the child, but the age of the child taken in conjunction or in the context of sort of the atmosphere of testifying specifically in this case, in this courtroom, um, with different things uh, going on as far as the amount of people and things of that nature. Um, so I, again, I don't foresee this being an issue, uh, but just an issue that I wanted to flag for the court. Uh, should it become an issue uh, and seek sort of the court's <laughs> ruling or permission in regard to it uh, prior to any sort of incident arising? Okay, given that caveat, is there any objection? Thank you, Laura. I appreciate that. No objection. I feel, I'll be honest with you, I feel like out of rhythm a little bit because, you know, you get into that rhythm of doing shows and then you got to back out for a little bit. I've just been so occupied and so busy and it sucks. It sucks. My, my channel for like a week had no content and the views on it went way down. So I knew I had to get back and do something here, but we'll, uh, We'll get it going soon. It's it's getting there. It's about about 60% complete right now. We're getting there. 
All right, let's keep ripping through this, ripping butts with Lally through this. At this point, Your Honor, we can address it as it arises. Okay. Mr. Lally, keep in mind, Not the jurors yet. would much rather hear from the witnesses than from the Commonwealth. Of course. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. Mr. Clerk, on, on that, we're just going to withhold ruling. Withhold ruling till a later time. Um, Commonwealth, you'll raise this again if need be. Yes, sir. All right. Hey, Danny. Thank you, thank you. All right. So on your next motion, your number 13. Um, <clears throat> huh. I had it. I don't, I don't have it in order. Just give me a minute. So I'm curious, do you happen to have... Oh, oh, we don't have the screen up. Do you have it... I'd like to see exactly what it is that you intend to introduce. Thank so you. this is your motion eliminate to admit evidence that the defendant was in custody for a period of time <laughs> after her arrest. Sharon. Jim, is it possible for you to print that for me? Um, 13. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll hear you on this, Mr. Lally. And remind me the date that this body cam footage was taken. So, Your Honor, this is in reference to uh, the defendant's arrest post indictment uh, by the grand jury in this case. So, it's June 9, 2022. So, that's why I have not seen the video itself. <laughs> Correct. And, and that's certainly something that the Commonwealth uh, can, can provide for the court. But uh, essentially, when she's arrested and uh, during this the is when Lally lies. This is when Lally lies booking process at the Milton State Police Barracks, um, the troopers who uh, conducted that arrest uh, were wearing a uh, body-worn camera um, pursuant to their, their BWC policy uh, with the state police. Um, council has a copy of the policy, council has a copy of the video, and essentially there are a number of different statements which provide sort of um, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, I'm not sure what number we're up to at this point uh, of sort of varying accounts that the defendant has provided to can, numerous Can you give people. me an idea now? Do you, do you know the substance? So the substance of these particular statements uh, is uh, the defendant, Ms. Reed, uh, continuously uh, is told by Sergeant Buchanan uh, to essentially stop talking. He's advised her of her Miranda and advised her to, to stop making statements uh, and repeatedly states that to her. Yeah, nice, nice try, Pat, uh, Daniel. Nice try. Didn't happen. Would not happen. Nice try, though. Love it. Good stuff. If you want to keep paying me, that you can keep paying me, but it's not true. <laughs> I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. Who the hell is Mike Redbar? During the course of her making statements, uh, but the sum and substance of it uh, is, she says something to the effect of, "You know, are you in on the joke?" Good stuff. Uh, and that makes you keep some sort money of reference out there, uh, to having witnessed Brian Albert and Colin Albert uh, essentially smash John O'Keefe's head into the taillight, indicating that that's how her taillight was broken. Um, doesn't make any sort of further statements about why she would then leave the scene after that occurred or anything like that. Uh, but these are, again, uh, different accounts uh, that have been made uh, in direct variance to prior statements that she made January 29th uh, to the troopers, to paramedics, to treating medical professionals, to Ms. Roberts, to Ms. McCabe, to uh, the niece of Mr. O'Keefe, to a whole <laughs> other sort of uh, slew and variety of, of people with a different sort of... I'll take the five bucks, though. Thank you. <laughs> you want to keep throwing five bucks in there, whatever. <laughs> uh, variation on what transpired uh, each time. Uh, so it's sort of inextricably intertwined if i was gonna pay a cam girl i wouldn't pay her just to smell her feet i'd pay her to do a lot more <laughs> uh, with the fact that she's in custody I, uh, I, how so is she in handcuffs is she in a she's cell? seated at the uh the booking desk or the booking rail in the state police barracks uh so i i mean i don't need to make direct reference to it I, it's just again it's something out of abundance of caution based on sort of where it is and when it is that the statements are made uh that 
it may naturally sort of come out as far as it, if the court wishes. I, I think it's something that the court can can cure uh, by issuing a curative instruction uh, if there's any prejudice to be suffered by the defendant. Uh, but again, um, it is a statement by the defendant, which is admissible as the court is well aware. Uh, and then uh, it is sort of in the confines or in the context of her being in custody when she makes that statement. I certainly wouldn't be trying to elicit <laughs> testimony that she was in custody, but it, it's, it is kind of apparent that she is. Can you have that here for this afternoon? Uh, yes, I, I can arrange for that. So we can see it? Sure. All right, what's the defendant's position here? Like I said, if I was going to pay a cam girl, I wouldn't pay her just to smell her feet. I'd pay her to do a lot more. <laughs> you should have thought that one out a little bit better, bro. <laughs> we object. Your Honor, uh, we're in a... I want to see a lot more than sniff her feet. Oh, I love it. Good stuff. Smell a vision. Yes. <laughs> hey man, they can they can send me four dollar, five dollar super chats all day if you want to keep putting that crap in there. Situation now where oh, it's good stuff. Uh, the Commonwealth arrested Ms. Reed twice when they didn't have to. Uh I, I made the argument to you at arraignment uh back in June of 2022 that after John O'Keefe was found dead on the lawn of Brian Albert, uh, Al Brian Albert's home, um, I immediately got a letter out to the state police saying, I represent her, I will surrender her, no need to arrest her, just call me and I'll bring her in. They ignored that and they arrested her. That's where Yanetti really starts catching on fire here. Uh, to get her into custody, um, I would assert ultimately to make the arguments that Mr. Lally's making today. Uh, then, uh, astonishingly to me, uh, after the grand jury issued indictments, based on basically no new evidence, uh, they uh, upcharged her and once again did not contact me, despite the fact that she was completely in compliance with the terms of her release and had made every court appearance. They arrested her again. Uh, and so, again, I would assert to be in the position that there are, they are in today. Um, with regard to the case that they cited, Your Honor, uh, Hoffer does not stand for the proposition that they claim that it does. Uh, in fact, uh, the issue of uh, that defendant being taken into custody was stricken by the court. Uh, the uh, testimony in that case uh, that was allowed uh, or sanctioned by the SJC was uh, evidence that uh, the defendant had been living uh, with his uh, girlfriend, but had unexplained absences. He didn't get along with her son. She was afraid of him and that he associated with a, a, conduct, a, a convict that made her uh, nervous. There was nothing about him being in custody that was admitted in that case. Um, to the extent that these statements are, or the court deems these statements to be relevant and admissible, um, there are other ways to do it. Uh, I do urge the court to watch the video. Yeah, I, I think we'll put it on the screen because I want to see how the jury would look at it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but I will suggest, Your Honor, that there are other ways to accomplish that, uh, you know, either to uh, have testimony about what it was or, failing that, uh, to have the audio of my client making whatever statements they seek to introduce without the video. Uh, an image of my client uh, you know, in handcuffs at a police station is what this court uh, generally tries to avoid, given the fact that as she sits here and as this trial is ongoing, she's presumed to be innocent. We wouldn't bring her up here in, in an orange jumpsuit right. and then ask the jury to make decisions about her, nor should we uh, display her, uh, you know, after, the, after a, a perp walk at the police station in handcuffs uh, making these statements. All right. right. So I need the Commonwealth to, do you have um, your media person available, Ms. Gilman or Ms. Crawford or whomever? Yes. All right. We're we'll, seeking we'll, to make arrangements for that. All right. We'll put it on the screen just so I can see how the jury works. <clears throat> all right. Thank you. So that's, we'll look at that this afternoon.
All right, so I'll hear you on the celebrate motion, uh, your motion number 16, Ms. Delali. Thank you, Your Honor. So in this motion, what the Commonwealth is requesting uh, is uh, for permission uh, for the uh, celebrated expert, Mr. Whiffen, uh, to uh, conduct a demonstration in the courtroom during the course of his testimony in regard to uh, the um, examination that he did in regard to Ms. McCabe's extraction report and specifically uh, the uh, alleged search, uh, which the defendant purports uh, occurred at 227 in the morning and the Commonwealth maintains occurred at 623 and 624. I want to stop you because one question is how long will this take if we allow it? How long will the demonstration take? So um, really what I'm seeking to do ideally uh, would be for sort of a live demonstration, uh, which I had uh, Mr. Whiffen do and record and provided a copy of, of that to, uh, to counsel as well. Uh, so that recording that I, that I provided uh, has no audio to it, but there was also a uh, PowerPoint presentation that Mr. Whiffen prepared in relation to uh, the same issue uh, that he uh, produced. And then I provided that to, uh, to counsel as well, which essentially goes through what he did. Um, and it also- You're not looking to do a PowerPoint presentation, are no, you? No, no, no. The PowerPoint presentation would not be something I'd be looking to admit. The reason I did the video is in the event that technology is not our friend on that particular day and, and the live demonstration doesn't work, uh, I would then be seeking to uh, introduce the video and have him talk about it uh, while it's playing. Um, it mirrors uh, essentially or exactly uh, what Mr. Whiffen had uh, included in his report, uh, which was done back in uh, almost a year ago at this point and has been provided to counsel uh, and is essentially the same thing uh, as what's contained in his report, but just uh, as far as a, a visual uh, aid and demonstration uh, for the jury. Um, I just think it's a bit with when particularly talking about sort of the technical aspects uh, of his particular analysis, uh, the Commonwealth uh, would submit that it would be uh, helpful and assistive uh, to the jury in order for them to have that sort of visual uh, demonstration to go along with uh, obviously the oral testimony of, of the witness as well. All right, who's well, arguing this for the defense? I appreciate it, thank you. I'm a, I'm a little you, rusty. Honor. We received from the Commonwealth the video that Mr. Lally just described um, about 48 hours ago. So we have not had an opportunity to confer with our expert about that particular issue. Okay. Um, however, just from sort of a cursory review, it does appear that its admission is improper. Um, as the Commonwealth acknowledges in its motion, in order for the court to allow a courtroom experiment or reenactment, there are very strict rules concerning that experiment. It has to replicate with exactitude the actual event so that it is fair and informative for the jury. Otherwise, it's prejudicial and would serve only to confuse the jurors. Mm. Here, just based on a cursory review, it does not appear that Mr. Whiffen's in-court experiment replicates all of the factors that we know were in existence at the time in question. Does it, does it replicate the factors that he says he considered? So I'll, I'll need to have a little additional time if the court doesn't mind to yeah, confer so, with so, my expert. Yeah, so I will give you time to confer with your expert and file a written response. But that, that's one of the factors that I'm asking you to look into. Understood. And then just if the court does intend after a written briefing to consider admitting that evidence, we would ask to be able to take their expert on voir dire as to that particular issue. Okay. Thank you. All right. How much time, Ms. Little, do you think you'd need to confer with your expert and put something in writing? Um, I believe a, about a week should be sufficient, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I, I neglected to answer the court's question as far as timing. The video uh, demonstration, which is essentially what I'd be asking him to do, is about 19, 20 minutes. All right, so Mr. Clerk, that's under advisement. So what remains on Commonwealth's motion 17? The no statement, so the, 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 the So I know this also went, this went to the, the blood draw, but there were statements. 
That's what separates this from the defense motion to exclude the testing. Mm -hmm. So I'll hear you on that. Is the defense objecting to that portion of the Commonwealth's motion? Thank you for, for uh, that opportunity. Not particularly, no. It's the, it's the blood draw and the extraction. Yeah, so the motion had both. So that's why, all right. So I guess we don't need to hear. So the, the part of your motion that concerns the statements made by the defendant, the defense is not objecting to. No, the, uh, very obviously, they're admissions. I mean, everybody knows what the rules are dealing with admissions. <clears throat> so I'm not concerned about that. Okay. All right, so Jim, on 307, it's a split. Jim, it's Jim. Um, the Commonwealth is permitted to introduce Jim. statements made for purposes of medical treatment. Jim. And the certified medical records. But there's an objection as to what we've heard regarding the alcohol testing, the blood testing for alcohol. Okay. Jim. All right. You're Jim. number 20, Mr. Lally. Our number. 20, Your Honor, I believe, uh, refers back to the, the same argument that the Commonwealth had made in opposition to the defendant's motion to exclude anything about the nature of the relationship. Okay. Uh, things of that. That's why I don't Jim. have it right here. Okay. Jim. Jim. 21, the out of court statements regarding the victim's state of mind. So 21 uh, sort of pertains to that same issue as 20. Uh, so essentially it's it's the same argument. You're on the same facts underlying it as far as statements uh, that the uh, victim, Mr. O'Keefe, made but, to. But were you making statements regarding like bins and in, in those cases, Commonwealth versus bins, the, the state of mind of the defendant, the defendant, I mean, state of mind of the victim, the defendant knowing it, the defendant being able to act as a result specifically? Okay. So on that sort of specific application of, and that's that's why we filed two separate motions right. in relation to it. But as it applies to that, uh, the Commonwealth would submit it as clearly we met its burden under the case law as it applies to that because of the nature of some of those communications. Uh, so it's not just communications that are observed uh, by other parties as far as what uh, the victim, Mr. O'Keefe, uh, indicated uh, to Ms. Reed, or these aren't situations like in some of the case law where it's an indication to a third party and the defendant wasn't present and then there's sort of an inference that can be made that well if they're saying it to this friend of theirs then they must have communicated that to the person with whom they were in the relationship with in this instance your honor we have direct communication between mr o'keefe and miss reed uh, via text communications from each of their phones uh, indicating that that communication about ending the relationship was made just prior to uh the date of his death in this particular case uh, so it not only uh, enhances but what I would submit is corroborates uh, that testimony from from other sources or from other family members and, and other witnesses. Uh, so for those reasons, the Commonwealth that would ask that this motion be allowed. All right. Jim. Your Honor, on this motion, our position is that uh, we'd like more specificity about which statements the Commonwealth is indicating they seek to admit. Um, I imagine that's that, the same thing I said to you, Mr. Lally, on the other one that was right uh, in connection with this. Right. So the Commonwealth will do that. Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. And, and I think then at that point we can evaluate it, Your Honor. Certainly, some of these statements are are going to come in, uh, but we'd like the opportunity to be able to object if they. Uh, are no, not I, 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 I agree. So it has to be clear. So, you know, as far as the your notice to the defense, you can even point to grand jury minutes or whatever, but I need to know the, the statements you intend to introduce. Understood, Your Honor. And, and what I can do and what I'm, I aim to do to sort of an ancillary thing is um, I'd like to, uh, if the court is amenable and counsel is amenable, to, to pre-mark as many exhibits as possible um, just to make the situation easier for both sides uh, as far as referencing documents, photographs, videos, things of that nature. Um, so when it comes to, uh, I'm not seeking to introduce, uh, when it comes to any sort of the, the cell phone abstractions, um, I'm certainly not opposed to uh, admitting the entire abstraction 
a dump essentially from, from anybody's individual phone. Uh, but what I'd like to do uh, as far as exhibits are concerned is to uh, print out or create sort of uh, extraction reports uh, from those cell phones as far as different communications between person A, person B, just to make it more simple for the jury to, to digest it and more simple for, I think, everyone involved to understand sort of the, the exact communications that we uh, intend to talk about. Uh, so in that vein as well, uh, <clears throat> what Elida can do is, is provide uh, a supplemental memorandum in regard to 20 and 21. Memorandum. Referencing memorandum. sort of those specific conversations. Okay. That'd be great. And it, if you can work together, and this will be part of the housekeeping we talk about this afternoon, um, work together to pre-mark exhibits, that would be great. All right, so to So again, with 20, with respect to 22, uh, and I think the same can probably be said uh, for 23 uh, and 24 and 25, uh, is that essentially, uh, as I've stated earlier, the Commonwealth is somewhat operating in the dark and that I don't have any discovery, I don't have a witness list, I don't have any investigator reports or notes or notice of an expert or notice of an, any sort of expert reports, curriculum vitae really anything. Um, so out of an abundance of caution, the Commonwealth filed uh, motion to eliminate number is 22, which is in reference to any alleged bad character or any prior misconduct uh, of the victim or any witness uh, that the defendant alleges uh, to uh, seek to elicit through whatever witnesses uh, they may or may not have. Uh, but essentially what I would state in regard to this specific issue uh, is that as the court is well aware, it has to be uh, something that uh, is first of all relevant uh, to anything. And it also has to be relevant uh, to a reputation and not just an anecdotal uh, something that, that's brought up from one witness, again, who I, I don't even know who those witnesses would be at this time. So um, I don't know that the court can rule on it without any sort of notice uh, as to whether or not the defendant intends to seek to introduce such evidence or has any such evidence or who those witnesses would be or what their level of, of knowledge would be. But it's it's something that I at least wanted to, uh, to flag uh, for the court in regard to um, if it comes up as we go along. Who's responding? That would be me, Your Honor. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, this will be very brief. Um, the Commonwealth, in their at least in their moving papers, uh, Mr. Lally, uh, I, I think, has gently stepped back from the moving papers a little bit. The moving papers suggest that they seek to preclude the defense per, from presenting any evidence to the jury that uh, one or more of their witnesses lied or gave false information in, in this case in any particular. They call this, they, they do this under the rubric of bad character, but that misunderstands or misapprehends what bad or what character evidence actually is. Character evidence or bad character evidence refers to using past behaviors or past traits of a person to prove a, a propensity to act in a certain way in the future. Um, conversely, Proving that someone lied or gave false or misleading information regards to, in, in regards to a, a specific matter that's relevant and material to the case at hand, that's called impeachment. And that's allowed in every single courtroom <clears throat> across So the impeachment's certainly allowed, but do you intend to put on witnesses regarding challenging character evidence? No, yeah. we're not intending to. That, that's exactly what I was going to summarize by saying the, the bad character focuses on general character traits, uh, whereas impeachment deals with people who right. lied or were untruthful. We Mr. intend Lally, to do the latter. Hold on, Mr. Lally, you're not objecting to impeachment, prior inconsistent statements, things like that. No, of course so not. So you... you um, counsel, you mentioned that there is a distinction between character right. evidence and straight impeachment. Character evidence is not permissible because you're not going to introduce it, you said, right? We're not seeking to introduce it at this point. We wouldn't. I mean, obviously, the trial has to play out and it's going to be several weeks. And by the way, this is what I this is what I talked about. You know, bringing someone's character into it. That's what Lally essentially is going to do with this. I talked about this. They're going to bring he's going to bring in character. The argument here is the argument about bringing character in. I mean, Lally may go, oh, you know, like I was saying before, oh, they had a, a terrible relationship. She was always angry at John, and she was this type of person, and and this witness said that she was this. You know, they may bring in witnesses like that. 
when Mr. Lally has mentioned over and over and over about how he has no reports and no statements, et cetera. He's got more than 7,000 reports and statements, both from his own investigation and from the federal investigation that in, in no small part encapsulates a lot of what we intend to impeach with. Mm -hmm. However, as I stand here today, I can report to the court that we don't intend at this juncture to put on bad character evidence. We, we don't know what that might look like, oh, but okay. if we did, obviously I know the rules. I would give the Commonwealth due notice and, and the court notice before right. we went that direction. All right, so 312, Mr. Clerk, is allowed. If you need to readdress that, uh, defense counsel, um, you need to file a motion, okay? So 30, 312, Jim, is allowed. Yeah. Uh, that's what I'm saying. Like they talk, oh, she's this terrible person. And, and, uh, you know, we have witnesses to support that one time she argued with someone and that, uh, that's essentially what they're doing. Same thing. Do you intend to put on character evidence? Uh, right. Difficult standard and, and or potentially problematic, but, uh, do you intend to do it? Your Honor, we at this juncture do not have intend to put on character evidence, but we will give the court notice as well as Mr. Lally notice if we do change our mind. All right, so 313, Jim, is allowed and defendants can renew it. I'm sorry, what's the second part? Why? Defendants can renew it yeah. by written motion. How about 24? Is there an objection to that? I believe that was 24. Yeah. No, that was no, it's 23. Oh, I apologize. 23, we had said we had no objection. Okay, I didn't And have 24 it. is the opinion or character. Okay, so 24 is, all right. I'm sorry. 20, 24 is allowed, Jim. 23 and 24 are allowed. That's <laughs> sorry. Oh, my God. All right. There's an objection to 25, Ms. Little. Just yes, yes or honor, no. Mr. All right, Jackson so is, so I'm going to hear from Mr. Lally on the motion. I just wanted to know if there was an objection. Oh, excuse me. Your Honor, I could probably, if I don't, I don't mean to step on Mr. Lally's toes. If he wants to talk, he can talk. Uh, we don't anticipate asking any of our experts to read from a treatise. If that's what his concern is, and that's how I read the motion, we don't anticipate going there. That might short circuit this. So no treatise, no studies. They will refer to studies. They're not going to read from studies on the witness stand at this point, at this juncture. Certainly, their their studies are the foundation of every expert's um, testimony. I mean, okay, but but what he's saying is he he has no discovery of even who your experts are. So how's he going to read all these articles? I understand that. So I understand that. as the court knows, and and we anticipate, and I think Mr. Yunetti is going to address this with the court soon enough. He will be getting our expert reports. We now have finally. Uh, their uh, their final notice of what their discovery is. Certificate uh, of compliance. And we are anticipating by the, the beginning of trial, by Tuesday, to have something in response to that. But no, we're not going to we're not going to elicit uh, an expert to sit there and read from a study or read from a treatise if that's what their concern is. Excuse me. Anything you wanted to add to this? It looks a little broader than that to me. It, it is a little bit broader than that, um, as far as it also refers to anecdotal experiences or, or things of that nature, which obviously wouldn't be contained within a study or wouldn't be contained within certain materials. Uh, so I, I'm sure counsel is well aware, and I'm, I'm not certainly saying that they're not, as, as far as what an expert can testify to and what an expert cannot testify to. Um, <laughs> but essentially what an expert can testify to is, is facts that they personally observe based on testing or things that they do uh, themselves. Um, facts uh, in regard to uh, things that are in evidence or things that the council reasonably expects will be put into evidence, but the studies themselves, any sort of anecdotal uh, experiences that they may have had uh, or any sort of um, scientific literature uh, is not something that is permissible to be admitted as as an exhibit. So if that is something that they seek to, uh, to talk about, uh, the Commonwealth would submit that that's improper. You know, what they did in this particular case, sort of what their baseline of experience is, what their baseline as far as their educational background in order to form some sort of opinion based on on the facts as the, as the jury finds them uh, is certainly fine. But making any reference uh, to because it happened in this study, it must be true in this case is, is something that's simply not permitted. Okay. 
if I may, just briefly. Sure. Mr. Lally uses the phrase anecdotal experience. That's the first time I've ever heard that in, in this context. I don't know what he means by that. But if what he means by that is bringing into court something that the expert has done or experienced or has experience with, and then relating that back to his opinion or her, her conclusion, isn't that what he's suggesting Mr. Whiffen do with his in-court experiment? That sounds like an anecdotal experience, but th that's just me. I think we have to take this on a case-by-case -case basis um, and, and, and figure out what the experts are gonna say. I, I don't know what anecdotal experience means. So I can't really defend against that because I put hundreds, if not thousands of experts on the stand. I don't know that I've ever asked, can you tell the jury what your anecdotal experience is with fill in the blank? So I'm not sure what he, and I'm not being glib, I just don't know what that means. So I, I don't know that the court can adequately rule on it. I think this may be something that we wait until. The so let's get the list of the experts. Take a look at the Commonwealth's discovery, I mean, the uh, defendant's expert discovery to you, and you can raise it again. I think that's the only other time I've heard that word move, uh, word used, glib. Remember when uh, when uh, Tom Cruise, I don't know if you all remember this, but Tom Cruise was being interviewed by, uh, what was it, Matt Lauer, and he said, Matt, you're being glib. You're being glib. That was like all over the news. Remember that? You're being glib, Matt. Glib. Thank you. Remember that? Thank you. Glib. glib. Being glib. So, um, Jim was talking about Scientology and he got all pissed off. He's like, Matt, you're being glib. You're being glib, Matt. You should do your homework. Remember that? <laughs> Say no action taken. <laughs> all right. 27. I'll hear you, Mr. Lally. Yes. So, Your Honor, this motion eliminates in reference to uh, prohibiting uh, reference to any federal investigations conducted by the U.S. Attorney's Office or, and or the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Uh, so to this point, um, the U.S. Attorney's, Attorney's Office has uh, publicly it's confirmed that at no time uh, has the U.S. Attorney's Office named any person or entity uh, as a target. Uh, so any sort of reference uh, to uh, in, in essentially what they've uh, stated uh, throughout the course of, and I know the court has had a chance to review those materials but what they state is essentially <clears throat> their investigation into some yes, unnamed, right, uh, uh, criminal activity or some unnamed crime or some there, there's nothing specific uh, to any specific person or entity uh, that is contained within those materials so what the commonwealth is submitting is that any reference <laughs> to the fact that those things occurred uh is therefore uh unfair, you know, essentially biases uh, against uh, one side or the other based on uh, based on that. And it really has no relevancy. As far as making reference to, uh, you know, if, if counsel at some point, either side wants to make reference to uh, testimony or uh, statements, reports, things of that nature that were provided uh, in the course of, of that discovery uh, pursuant to the TUI, uh, obviously that's <coughs> perfectly permissible, but it also can be done without making reference to where that item came from. As far as you, you know, testify previously in relation to some investigation on such and such a date, uh, you know, uh, you spoke to V. Thank you so much for the cash app. I appreciate that. And says a uh, great job. You do. Thank you. Great. I appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thanks for the cash app. To, uh, a law enforcement agent on such and such a date and you said this. Um, so it, if it's needed for those kinds of reasons as far as impeachment and whatever, that's obviously perfectly permissible, but any reference uh, to that in front of the jury, uh, Your Honor, uh, is something that the Commonwealth would submit uh, is simply impermissible and irrelevant uh, to the facts uh, as they pertain to this case. Uh, so for those reasons, the Commonwealth would ask that this motion be allowed. Is there an objection to this? There is. <laughs> Your Honor, the Commonwealth's position can be basically summed up in their moving papers with the following sentence that they drafted. The proceeding would be unfairly prejudiced if the, if the defendant is permitted to rely on the mere appearance or existence of a federal investigation, especially where the investigation was shaped and influenced by the defense. First of all, the defense does not and did not shape or influence any federal investigation. Hmm. The federal government is more than capable, Your Honor, and I think the Commonwealth knows this, of making its own decisions 
and ab about its own investigations. Second, and just as importantly, the Commonwealth cites no authority whatsoever that stands for the proposition that the mere mention of a federal investigation prejudices state court proceedings in any way, shape, form, or fashion, and that's because there is no authority, that authority does not exist. But most importantly, and this is critical, it is going to be critical to give the trier of fact, this jury, the proper context in which every one of the statements or every bit of the evidence is presented and how it came to light. It's essential for the how, jury. How are you going to do that? How do you propose, is somebody from the U.S. Attorney's Office on your witness list to come in and talk about it? There are federal agents. No, 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 no. We, we don't anticipate presenting the fact that there's a federal investigation. That's isn't not, isn't that what this does? If no, you mention it, no. what, explain, what this does, explain to me why that's not so. The, that's what I'm doing. As the, as not, the court, not yet, you haven't. So oh please God. explain that. Let him as talk. The court knows it's a Jesus. She's gonna do this the whole damn trial. Let the guy talk. Like, quit cutting him off. See, it's so annoying. The guy's like on a run and he's trying to get his thoughts together and she keeps throwing stuff at him and he's like, you know, he gets distracted and has to rethink. It's it's ridiculous. The guy is trying to explain it. This is, it's, you know, like, shut up, let him talk. And and she does this with uh, Yanetti all the time too. And it's annoying. And you're going to see that later here in the, the hearing. Yanetti starts getting on a roll and she's like, Oh, I think this is a good time that we should take a break. It's uh, it's really hot in here. And you can see when Yanetti pulls away from the podium, he's pissed because he's on a roll with very important information, very important evidence and facts to discuss. She always constantly does this. Like, let the guy talk. Like, it's so annoying. Like, let's hear him. You know, I get it. We're, we're pro Karen, but we want a fair trial in this. We want a fair trial for both sides. We want the facts to come out. We want the evidence to come out. So when it comes out, it's clear and concise to the jury and that Karen will be exonerated from all of these frivolous charges. But let the poor guy talk, you know, let him make a point here. Jesus Christ. That the jury Boy. is given the context in which every single statement, whatever the statement might be, is brought to light. Does that mean, do we say in the prior trial that resulted in a mistrial, is you here. said this? No, but you would say when you were speaking with Officer Smith or Officer right. Jones from the Canton Police Department at the Canton Police Station in this particular context, did you say this? When you were, uh, when you were questioned by the Commonwealth's attorney in this proceeding, did you say this? When you were questioned by the United States attorney in this hearing, did you say that? That's what we do. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's perpetrating a fraud on the jury. The information that's gleaned during the federal investigation was revealed, Your Honor, importantly, by a neutral third party, a neutral body that's not connected in any way to this case. The Commonwealth has a stake in this case, very obviously. The defense certainly has a stake in this case, but the federal authorities have no stake in the case of the Commonwealth versus Karen Reed. Right there. Yes, the evidence procured by that neutral agency, which is independent of the case, is subject to a different and completely, a completely different level of scrutiny, a completely different level of assessment by the jurors. Right that there. That is an important fact. There is no other way to truthfully and honestly present this evidence to the jury. Think, think about some of the questions that the court just posed. What were the circumstances in which you changed your testimony, sir? He's going to say, well, I changed my testimony, potentially, when I was called before a federal grand jury and I was asked questions under penalty of perjury. Why did you finally admit certain things when you were confronted with additional evidence, ma'am? And where did that evidence come from? Well, I was called before a grand jury and I was asked, or I was investigated, uh, I'm sorry, I was interviewed by a federal agent and I was asked or mm. confronted with additional information, this text messages, important. phone calls, etc. Or the third example, where did that additional evidence come from, officer? Text messages, uh, phone calls, private communications. Oh, it came from uh, a hearing in which I was questioned by a United States attorney under penalty of perjury in front of a grand jury. The jury's entitled to those answers in that context. If we were to do what Mr. Lally suggests, if we were to take that invitation, oh, well, you were asked by a prosecutor at a former hearing um, see, they want the Fed. They want the Fed information in because this is going to back up and solidify their defense. 
it's going to make a jury look at this and say, well, wait a minute here. If the feds are looking at the investigation, then something must be wrong here. How can this be believable from the Commonwealth? That's what Jackson's fighting for here. He wants the jury to be able to hear, hey, I, you know, I was questioned. I said that during a questioning from a federal agent. I said that in, in a, you know, I said that in front of the grand jury testimony in front of federal, federal agents. That's essentially what Lally, um, I'm sorry, Lally, <laughs> Jackson is fighting for here. Because if he has that backup, like I said, if he backs this all up with the federal investigation into the investigation, it just solidifies everything that they've been saying since the beginning, that Karen Reed did not do this. And if they can get that to the jury and the jury can understand that, and we know the feds are not going to get involved unless they got the goods on someone or something, it's, it nails this down. It nails it down that Karen Reed did not do this. I mean, we know that anyway. But to the jury, it really sticks it and solidifies it. X, Y, Z. That would leave the jurors with the imprimatur of the idea You're that absolutely the Commonwealth right, Jeremiah. elicited those questions. <laughs> that the Commonwealth did their job when we know, in fact, it didn't. The answers to those questions directly go to Ms. Reed's Bowden defense. Absolutely. Bowden talks about the inadequacy of an investigation. Obviously, Mr. Lally, I'm sorry, Mr. Gennetti can talk more about that in just a second. We have information that a different agency was able to uncover information that the state investigation ignored. That's important. And it's important for the jurors to be able to weigh and balance that information and how the information came to light. If the truth is actually hidden from the jury, which is what the Commonwealth is asking the court to do, that the evidence was produced. Bowden talks about the inadequacy of an investigation. Obviously, Mr. Lally, I'm sorry, Mr. Gennetti can talk more about that in just a second. We have information that a different agency was able to uncover information that the state investigation ignored. That's important. And it's important for the jurors to be able to weigh and balance that information right. and how the information came to light. If the truth is actually hidden from the jury, which is what the Commonwealth is asking the court awesome, to Daniel, do. Awesome, right on point, right there, right on perfect that the timing. evidence was produced by a, was the product of a third party. The truth being that the evidence was the product of a third party inquiry, unconnected to the state court case, then that jury is left with a false impression, false information, and it'll be unable to, unable to properly assess the true facts, which is what we're trying to get to, the true facts. Why is the Commonwealth so intent on hiding the truth from this jury. Mm, right. Awesome. Okay. He's I'll right. We rule on that today. So, uh, number 28, Mr. Lally. Thank you, Aaron. So, again, similar to the, the motion previous to it, um, the Commonwealth is not seeking to hide anything from uh, the jury. Uh, what the Commonwealth is simply seeking to do is ensure that whatever information that's provided to the jury is actual admissible and relevant information and not uh, the the product of uh, rank speculation. So this motion uh, is seeking to prohibit reference to any pending internal affairs investigation or uh, unfounded allegations of misconduct. And really, primarily what we're talking about here uh, is any sort of uh, internal affairs investigation related to uh, Trooper Proctor and uh, the 20 something year old uh, uh, civil case uh, which resulted in no findings of liability uh, that was referenced uh, by counsel in their motion to dismiss with reference to Sergeant Lank of the Canton Police Department. Uh, under the case law, uh, including McFarland uh, and uh, Graham, the most recent case law, uh, what they essentially uh, attribute is that those uh, types of information, when there is no uh, finding of liability, there is no sustained finding of misconduct, there is no uh, uh, findings of liability uh, by uh, the party at question, uh, that that is simply not admissible. Uh, and so for those reasons, uh, the Commonwealth submits that this motion should also be allowed. All right, who's arguing this for the defense? And Ms. Little, what I, I need to know is what exactly you intend to introduce and how you intend to introduce it. 
Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I think it's it's somewhat premature for the court to, to rule on this issue. Obviously, the testimony of both of these witnesses is going to be highly relevant as to whether this particular information is relevant. Um, we are still actually receiving information with regards to the internal affairs investigation as recently as yesterday. Um, so I'm happy to like kind of defer ruling to the court and then address this as it comes up. I think the court will be in a much better position to rule on this issue once the witness testifies. All right. So it would be helpful to me once you know what it is you think you're going to try and introduce. Um, They're talking about the internal investigation into Proctor. So more information has come out. Um, to tell me how that complies with don't know what it is. the holdings in both McFarland and Graham. There are independent reasons why that is admissible outside of McFarland and Graham. Okay, so I need to know all of that. Sure. Okay. Thank you. So um, I'll take this under advisement. And how much time do you oh, need to give me at least a general response now? Can you have it by Tuesday? We can do that, Your Honor. Okay. He is pushing this case. Pushy, 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 pushy. Pushy, pushy. Tuesday, Tuesday, Tuesday. Pushy, pushy. She wants this to go to trial. All right, so I'll hold off on that, Mr. Clark. Yes, ma'am. All right. So number 29, Mr. Lally. I'm not sure, Kim. Maybe. Hopefully. Maybe something will so slip this out. motion, Your Honor, uh, is essentially entitled uh, motion to eliminate for advanced notice if defendant intends to cross-examine any witness about alleged bias uh, and request for a pretrial ruling on whether proposed evidence demonstrates plausible showing uh, of alleged bias. Uh, so the Commonwealth is not uh, stating that there are uh, no statements, uh, as the court is well aware, uh, that could uh, be interpreted to reflect uh, bias and could be used uh, by counsel in cross-examination. Uh, so uh, what the Commonwealth is not suggesting, uh, and bless you, is uh, for any prohibition on any statements whatsoever. What the Commonwealth is seeking here is uh, a ruling as to what precise uh, statements the defendant seeks to introduce uh, in regard to that uh, so that the court can make a ruling prior uh, to uh, the witness testifying before the jury as to exactly what's in play and what is going to be admissible and what's going to be allowed uh, as far as um, Obviously, it's not a perfect world, and, and if uh, a witness were to answer something in a way uh, that uh, would then um, open the door for, for further material to come in, that's understandable. But at least a preliminary showing as to exactly what uh, the defendant submits are the statements they wish to introduce in relation to this issue. Isn't the defendant given broad range and cross-examination as to bias? Yes, uh, and, and that's why I, I indicated early on uh, that I understand that there is a, some, um, that there certainly is uh, some areas uh, that under the law, whether or not they're true or not, are, are able to be explored as far as cross-examination is concerned. Uh, but what this motion simply seeks to address uh, is there are restrictions to that. It's, it's not unfettered. It's not, you know, just anything and everything that they could possibly think of as say as far as accusations go. Is there um, any particular type of testimony you're concerned about? I mean, is, is there anything in particular that you say they should not pr be permitted to go into? Based on what we've heard throughout the pendency of this case, is there anything? And I'm reluctant to tie the defendant's hands in any way on cross-examination without knowing exactly what it is you think is improper. Okay. And what I would do, Your Honor, what I would uh, suggest is uh, similar to the other motions that we spoke of before, I can provide I can provide a supplemental with more specifics as to what the Commonwealth's concerns are, okay. uh, if the court would find that helpful. Yes, I, I can't rule on this as is. So is there any objection to that, Ms. Giannetti? You're nodding. Well, no, I, I think that makes sense. Okay. I, I, it was Ms. Little's uh, motion. Oh, I'm sorry. I saw you nodding. I don't want to step on her toes. Uh, no objection to that, Your Honor. Okay. All right, so why don't you do that? So sure. Mr. Clerk will hold off on ruling on this until we get something from the Commonwealth. Okay. So, so the Commonwealth will clarify. Right, and then no action taken.
All right. So, as you know, third party culprit and Bowden are often argued together, often presented together. Why don't we just deal with the two motions together? So, Commonwealth's file, you're, you're number 30 and 31, um, Mr. Lally. Um, Mr. Yanetti, are you arguing both? Does it make sense okay. to sort of keep them together? I agree that they should be kept together. Yeah. All right. So, why don't I hear you as to your concerns on both? And and as you know, sometimes third party culprit as it goes to Bowdoin is different than just straight third party culprit. And actually, it might save us a lot of time. Is that what you intend to do, Ms. Tianetti? Third party culprit as it well, goes to Bowdoin or straight third party culprit as well? Definitely third party culprit as it goes to Bowdoin. That's for sure. Um, and then depending on how the evidence develops at trial, um, there may be, uh, you know, an, uh, an offer to. Kimberly, thank you so much for becoming a member. Uh, you have access to all the members only content. You can go right to my homepage, scroll all the way to the bottom, and that gives you access to all the members only. I've been doing a lot of behind the scenes uh, shoots in my video, my, my video, in my new studio, and that was kind of a perk to members. So you all, the members, and if you're all here and you are a member, and you haven't watched any of those videos, uh, or those lives, you're missing out. Uh, I've been doing a lot of kind of back behind the scenes footage in there. So you have capability to do that. If you want to become a, a member, just uh, click the join button down below. My membership started at buck 99 and you get access to all that content. So we will play on. We will play on. To offer third party culprit evidence with regard to third party culprits. But I think I can speak further to that in response. So go ahead. You can argue these however you want to argue them. No, it, and, and I, I would argue them sort of in that vein, Your Honor. So understanding that um, based on the state of the evidence, uh, as I anticipated to be, uh, and in any case, regardless, uh, I think a defendant in any criminal case has a Thanks, much Steve. better. Um, I got to keep making content to keep the lights on, though. <laughs> so any support I can get, I appreciate it. Believe me, any support I get. I appreciate it. It's been uh, a very expensive process. Um, shot essentially at getting evidence. A lot of my own money invested. As sort of a backdoor through, uh, excuse me, as to third party culprit, as sort of a backdoor through uh, a Bowdoin defense. Uh, so, what I'm primarily concerned with, Your Honor, is is uh, motion eliminate number thirty. Uh, because as the court is well aware, uh, there have been a number of, of Thank you, theories, I appreciate of, that. Uh, Thank sort you. of uh, speculation, rank speculation, uh, opinions. Uh, without any evidentiary support, uh, names of certain people that have been dropped at this microphone by counsel at different uh, pretrial hearings uh, who are not witnesses, who have nothing to do with this case, who don't know anything about this case, uh, who counsel when they said those names and sort of dropped those, whatever they supported to be facts, uh, knew that they had nothing to say and nothing to do with this case. <clears throat> um, what I'm uh, concerned about is whatever is acceptable as far as uh, 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 believability when it comes to arguing things in pretrial motions, shouting things from courthouse steps, or you know, bandying about on Twitter is is not what we do here. Um, and so now it is a time where uh, counsel is going to be relegated to what is actual, admissible, relevant evidence. Uh, and what I'm uh, asking uh, for in this motion is for the de defendant through her counsel to actually provide any admissible or relevant evidence that pertains to third party culprit, which to this point they have not done. Uh, so if this is something that's gonna be raised as an issue on its own, uh, as the court is well aware, what the uh, case law indicates is that the acts uh, of the other person are so closely connected in point of time and method of operation as to cast doubt upon the identification of the defendant as a person who committed the crime. Thanks, Jason, appreciate that. It has that. to be specific. Um, it has to be uh, to at least a specific realm of person uh, or a specifically identified person uh, who would have motive, opportunity uh, to commit uh, the act with which the defendant is charged. And up until this point, I have not seen anything uh, specific as to that. It's coming up. As it pertains uh, to uh, the Bowdoin uh, motion the Commonwealth filed, what the Commonwealth is asking for there is, is notice and, and voir dire in relation uh, to a Bowdoin defense. So if there is, uh, again, going to be some, you know, it, it's... 
I don't think the evidence comes anywhere close uh, to a Bowdoin instruction, uh, but certainly uh, what the courts have said uh, over time uh, is that uh, a Bowdoin defense is something that uh, if the evidence warrants it, uh, counsel can uh, elicit testimony in regard to it uh, or attempt to uh, and uh, make arguments in reference to it. So I'm not seeking to preclude uh, counsel from, from making arguments or from counsel asking questions. What I'm uh, seeking clarification on is, is what uh, exactly uh, and again, this is from a position of, of operating without any information whatsoever as, as to what uh, a defense may be. And understanding uh, that uh, counsel was not required uh, to provide any information until the Commonwealth filed its certificate of compliance. Uh, but there's been, regardless of whether they were required to or not, I, I'm, I'm going into trial on Tuesday without any information whatsoever as to, as to who they've spoken to, what, they're in, uh, what statements they might be, who their witnesses are, or anything of that nature. Uh, so for those reasons, the Commonwealth uh, feels it appropriate to at least file a motion to be given notice as to exactly uh, what the defendant intends to do. Um, this, the trial by ambush is simply not something that's permitted uh, uh, by the case law, uh, and that's what the Commonwealth is seeking to, uh, to prohibit in that second motion. Thank you. Okay. All right, Mr. Nettie, I'll hear you. <clears throat> Thank you. And though they're argued together, I do want you to also start with the third party culprit alone, not third party culprit as it goes to Bowdoin, but third party culprit alone because of all those factors that I told you. As you SJ Howard, thank you so much for the 10 on Cash App. I appreciate the support. Thank you. This is Lally, at, I mean, yeah, Lally. This is Yonetti at his best. He is going to fire and thunder away here. And of course, he's going to be interrupted by Bev. And you can see that he gets completely pissed here because uh, he needed a break. It's, it's hot in the courtroom. As you well know, the case is clear an hour. that I have to consider. And if I had to do it now, and you know I can do it pretrial, right? You know that I can today I can just exclude it. I'm not inclined to do that, but I need to be able to make those decisions to in, to weigh those factors because right now I have zero information. On right. This. I understand that, Your Honor, and uh, that was my plan going into today anyway. Uh, so the, the initial question is, um, why is there a third party culprit defense? Why is it relevant? Um, and we start, Your Honor, with the fact that our forensic medical examiner, Frank Sheridan, um, you know, a pathologist, forensic pathologist who has uh, performed himself thousands and thousands of autopsies has already submitted a sworn affidavit to this court that John O'Keefe's injuries are consistent with having been in a fight and this are not is consistent. This is huge right here. I remember this. This is huge. With having been hit by a car. Uh, since he submitted that affidavit, the federal authorities have provided us with their reports whereby FBI experts also corroborate that John O'Keefe's injuries are not consistent with having been hit by a car. They employed experts in biomechanics and kinematics who have reviewed the evidence in this case, and they've confirmed that the physical evidence uh, conf uh, essentially shows and doesn't show what Dr. Sheridan has opined. So therefore, <clears throat> if John O'Keefe was not hit by a car, that means that Cameron Reed did not kill him. And we know that John O'Keefe did not die of natural causes. This was not a heart attack or a stroke. John O'Keefe was injured. He was mortally injured. If he was not hit by a car, as both our expert and FBI confirmed, then he was attacked. And if, if he was not hit by a car, then there is a third party culprit or culprits. So by asking this court to prohibit the defense from introducing evidence that others had the motive, opportunity, and the means to attack John O'Keefe. The Commonwealth is essentially asking this court to prohibit Karen Reed from being able to defend herself. So I, I don't think they're asking that you be prohibited from doing that. They're asking first to have you tell them what that is. You got so pissed there. Right. Well, this is, you know, Your Honor, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to that in terms of all right, the, so go, go ahead. You, have, you have your that, remarks. That we're either required to give them or not. Unbelievable. Um, you know, it is not our job 
to solve this case right. for the prosecution. It's our contention. They had the opportunity to do that, but they failed. It is not our job to name a specific third party culprit. We do not have to prove that Brian Albert or Colin Albert or Brian Higgins or some combination of them intended to kill John O'Keefe. We don't have to prove that any of them attacked John <clears throat> O'Keefe such that he eventually died. They have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they didn't. But the fact of the matter is there is evidence that all three of them had a motive, had they, the opportunity and the means to attack John O'Keefe. Now, the, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Conkey in their motion, and as this court started the discussion on this issue when you first <laughs> took the bench, Conkey makes clear that a defendant has a constitutional right to argue that somebody else may have committed the crime. And certainly, no, the acts of that person can't be too attenuated in time or method of operation, as Mr. Lally uh, mentions. But in terms of being the right time period, Your Honor, <clears throat> you can't get any closer than their presence at the scene at the very time that John O'Keefe was killed. And in terms of the method of operation, given that we have evidence that he was not hit by a car and that he was attacked, all three of these men, either alone or in combination, possess the ability to attack him with or without a weapon. I mean, it's a very low standard here. The Commonwealth acknowledges that. It's a low standard of simple relevance. And the evidence here... Emmy, I apologize. I didn't see that come through. Thank you for becoming a member. I appreciate the support. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. All right, let's keep playing through. Thank you, Emmy. I appreciate that. Establishes relevance. Now, I would note, <clears throat> Your Honor, the Commonwealth cites Commonwealth versus Finney. I don't know if they realize this, but that was my case. I represented yes. Roland Douglas Finney before the Supreme <clears throat> Judicial Court, and I represented him at his motion for new trial and at his retrial. And that case, the Finney case, provides strong support for the introduction of third-party culprit evidence here, um, irrespective of a Bowdoin defense. Um, in fact, the reason that Mr. Finney's conviction was overturned was that his trial counsel failed to pursue, pursue a third-party culprit defense. And, Your Honor, the third-party culprit defense in Finney was weaker, far weaker, than the third-party culprit defense we have here. The evidence of motive in that case was that the third party culprit made derogatory statements about the victim after she was murdered. No witness in that case put the two of them together. No witness in that case put the third party culprit at the scene of the murder where the victim was murdered. There was some consciousness of guilt evidence similar to what we have in this case. But in Finney, the SJC ruled that not only was that enough for a defense attorney to present a, a third party culprit defense, but he was ineffective for not doing so. And as the, the court uh, has also uh, <clears throat> touched upon, uh, the, the SJC found that on the basis of that third party culprit evidence, which is weaker than what we have here, there were substantial connecting links between that third party culprit that justified the admission of hearsay in that case. And I want to make it clear, we're, we're not looking to introduce any hearsay statements, so we're, we don't need substantial connecting links here. Mm. Now, Your Honor, I could go through with the court the specific evidence we have with regard to motive oh, just gonna cut them off. and means with regard to the three Commonwealth witnesses that I've named. So uh, go ahead. Happy to do it. Uh, starting with Brian Higgins. He was present at 34 Fairview Road on January 28th Important. to 29th. He was close friends with the homeowner, Brian Albert. He had a prior romantic interest in Karen Reed he did not expect Karen and John O'Keefe to be at the waterfall, that bar, on January 28th. Karen Reed did not greet Higgins, despite the fact that they had previously exchanged flirtatious texts and that she had uh, been at his apartment one evening, although there was nothing that took place between them any more than a peck of a kiss. At the waterfall, Higgins does not engage with John O'Keefe. He does not say goodbye to John O'Keefe and Karen when he leaves. But before he leaves, he texts Karen. And that text was something to the effect of, um, well, with a lot of M's. Uh, we know that there was a preservation order from this court, your predecessor, Judge Krupp, to preserve his cell phone, and that Trooper Proctor, 
gave an, uh, him an edict um, to, to uh, you know, an order to serve uh, on Brian Higgins, and he left it at the front desk of the Canton police station for him, and that Higgins, we learned through the federal investigation, Higgins became angry, demanded that Proctor uh, come back, and he essentially upbraided him and read him the riot act, which shows a little bit about Higgins' personality. Mm. Um, at the end of the night, everyone discussed going back to 34 Fairview, and when he gets back to 34 Fairview, he texts not Karen, he texts John O'Keefe at 12.20 a.m. He testified before the federal grand jury that he had no knowledge that they had been invited to 34 Fairview. Mm. But that is contradicted mm. by this text message. And the inference is that he was coaxing John to come to that house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not saying this gives him a motive to kill John, but we don't have to show that. Uh, any motive to feel hostility or animosity towards John O'Keefe um, goes to his motive. And is it a possibility? Is it a possibility? And let's just say hypothetically here, I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but let's just throw a hypothetical against the wall. Is it a possibility that Higgins was very infatuated with Karen and was very upset that John was with her? Could that be a possibility? Could that lead to a motive inside of 34 Fairview? What do you all think? Clearly, Higgins is a lot more involved than we thought in this case. And we're getting a lot more information uh, that we we got a lot more information yesterday. Obviously, Lally's, I mean, Lally, I keep saying Lally, Yanetti is laying it all on the table right now. But like I said at the very beginning of this stream, in my opinion, innocent people don't destroy their phones. Innocent people don't destroy their SIM card. Innocent people don't destroy uh, their iPhone or, or Android device. They just don't do it. Uh, Higgins destroys his phone. Brian Albert destroys his phone. That's confirmed. Why? Why? Your Honor, when Brian Higgins and Brian Albert are in that was, house... Was Higgins pissed the fact that John was with Karen and Higgins wanted to be with Karen? Uh, as far as all the flirtatious texts and stuff like that, I could give a crap about it. I don't really care about uh, the personal relationships, with, you know, of what went on. But uh, clearly there was some flirting or friendly flirting going on. I mean, that's been put out there in the op open. The defense is accepting it. But maybe it wasn't as deep for Karen than it was for Higgins. And Higgins took it in the wrong way and then got jealous that John was with uh, Karen. It could be a possibility, hypothetically speaking, allegedly speaking, whatever. It's a possibility, right? Could be. House, they're the only two people who are unaccounted for when the rest of the group was in the kitchen. And they claimed that they were looking at photographs together. This is interesting, and too. We have evidence that they were in the basement. We believe that Brian Albert made a mistake before the state grand jury by testifying they went upstairs to look at photos. Brian Higgins says unequivocally that the only place the two went was into the living room to look at photos, the military ribbons, whatever they were looking at. Brian Higgins did not know that Brian Albert had said they went upstairs. And he also testified he had never been upstairs at Brian Albert's house in his life. That means that if Brian Albert said they went upstairs, they're coming up from the basement. And before leaving 34 Fairview, Brian Higgins testified he was parked right in front of the mailbox. He would have had to have walked by where John O'Keefe's body was. His headlights when he got in his vehicle would have been illuminating where John O'Keefe's body would have been in the yard if it were actually there. So how does he not see it? He then goes oh. back to the Canton police station at 1.30 in the morning after leaving 34 Fairview. He claimed to do some administrative work, but then he admitted to the federal grand jury that he was there to move his car because of the upcoming snowstorm. <clears throat> this suggests that he was fabricating a reason for going back to Canton police to establish an alibi for himself. Hmm. Um, he was asked several times at the federal grand jury if he had any conversations with anyone before he went to bed. 
Uh, and when was he notified that John O'Keefe was dead? In the morning, he said. He testified under the pains and penalties of perjury that he had absolutely no contact with any person that night for any reason whatsoever. But he did. But he apparently was surprised that the federal authorities had subpoenaed his phone records, and he had to admit, and he did admit under oath, he made that 2.22 a.m. phone <coughs> call around the same to about uh, you know, five minutes before Jennifer McCabe is Googling how long to die in the cold, about eight minutes before Brian Law from the plow driver first drives. It's funny, you know, I was listening to this. We, I was at my studio last night with my girlfriend. And we were we were watching this part because this was so intricate and so uh, detailed. You know, I looked at her and I said, you know what? The picture is all starting to become very clear. How all these little pieces of information that we heard at the very, very beginning of the case, you know, we heard about the uh, hustling the dying cold. We heard about, um, you know, we started to hear about the Higgins and, and Albert breaking their phones up. Then we heard that they had, there was uh, small other phone calls in between uh, with Higgins and uh, I think it was Higgins and Albert had, had a call. It was the, what was it? The 15 second call. Now we're going to hear about a call with uh, Berkowitz. So it's all, it all starts shaping and putting together what happened and gives you more of a clearer picture of like what happened inside that house, who was communicating, who was saying things. It's, it's crazy. It comes, I think Yanetti does a, a fine job of kind of wrapping all that together in this, this, uh, um, this segment here that he's, you know, he's testifying in court. Yes. And the butt dials <laughs> by the house and the sees dial. nobody at all. And the next morning, Brian Higgins, the first thing, first person he spoke to was Brian Albert. That was very interesting too. Uh, Karen's uh, brother looking over at the other side right here. I noticed that when Yanetti was speaking about some details here. Watch uh, right here. In the morning, he said, he testified under the pains and penalties of perjury that he had absolutely no contact with any person that night for any reason whatsoever. But he apparently was surprised that the federal authorities had subpoenaed his phone records and he had to admit, and he did admit under oath, he made that 2.22 a.m. phone call. Right. Around the same to about uh, you know five minutes before Jennifer McCabe is googling how long they're in the cold, shaking about yes. Eight minutes before right, look. Brian Law from the plow driver first drives by the house and sees nobody at all. And the next morning, Brian Higgins, the first thing, first person he spoke to was Brian Albert. After right, he, I'm going to stop you for yeah, so a what? minute. I think we need a break, Madam Court Reporter. Yanetti is pissed. Do you need a break? Can you go? How much longer do you think you have with this, Mr. Unetti? How many more pages or how long you think? Yeah, I've got about... Uh, Watch when he walks away from the podium. my recitation of the facts, uh, I've done about a page and a half, and I've got three left. Madam Court Reporter, would you like to take a little break? It's hot in here, and you've been going nonstop. Okay, let's take a 10-minute break. Look at He's like, yeah. All right, we'll fast forward it for... Here we go. <coughs> oh, something also very interesting in this. If anybody wants to go back and watch it, I did. I didn't want to go back and watch it for the interest of time, but if you go back to around eight minutes, there's a great moment of Jackson and Little having a discussion about where the jury would be seated in the courtroom. She asked Jackson, "Where do you think the jury would be seated in the courtroom?" And they're actually counting the seats. Uh, it's, it starts about the eight minute mark. If you want to go, it was caught on a hot mic. And um, I thought that was very, very interesting. All right, Mr. Unetti, go right ahead. Thank you. Excuse me. Your Honor, I left off with the uh, morning of January 29th. The first person that Brian Higgins spoke to was Brian Albert. Um, he had missed a call from Chief Kenneth Berkowitz earlier. Um, immediately after getting off the phone with Brian Albert, Brian Higgins drives back to 34 Fairview, where he has a meeting with uh, just about all the witnesses in this case, Brian Albert, Julie Albert, Jennifer McCabe, Matthew McCabe. And immediately after that friends and family meeting on his day off, which is a Saturday, 
he returns to the Canton Police Department where he speaks with all of the first responding officers who had anything to do with this case. So this is a quote unquote witness accessing and communicating with all the first responding officers, we would argue monitoring what they're doing in regard to the investigation. According to Brian Higgins, he admitted that Chief Berkowitz is one of his best friends and that's why he had access to all these people. We have a law enforcement witness who will testify to seeing Chief Kenneth Berkowitz and Brian Higgins alone with Karen Reed's vehicle on the afternoon of January. This is fucking crazy. This part is crazy. January 29th of 2022 for quote, a wildly long time. So is this a name that's been in the materials? Is, it, is this a name known to the Commonwealth? Or yes. Is this somebody new? Okay. We, and we've now received video surveillance from the Canton Police Department that shows that there is an interior camera in the Sallyport garage where the car was housed. But in, during the exact time that that third party officer indicates that Berkowitz and Higgins were in the Sallyport together, the video mysteriously cuts out this is for crazy. 42 minutes between 5.08 between 5.08 and 5.50 p.m. And just to be clear here, we never get to see the condition of the taillight when it's brought into the garage. When we do see the car, we see it after Brian Higgins, Chief Berkowitz, Michael mm -hmm. Proctor, and Yuri Buchnik have all had access to it. At 5.36 p.m., the car pings that it's arrived in the Sally Ooh. Court. That's during the missing video. Trooper Proctor, Trooper Buchnick never sees Brian Higgins' phone. They speak with him, and he takes it upon himself to use his own resources, Brian Higgins, within the federal government to ask a friend, Special Agent Mac Kelch, to download only the text messages in his phone between... I think there probably was a gasp when, you know, he talked about the 42 minutes missing. There was probably a gasp from the galley, something like that. That's why they told everybody to quiet down. Karen and him and him and John. And that's it. We have to take his word for it that we got all of them. And we certainly don't have any communications between him and Brian Albert, for instance. On February 10th, when he shows up to his interview with troopers Buchnick and Proctor, he brings with them copies of the text that he has deemed relevant Extracted. in their murder right. investigation. And he hands them the copies of the extraction that he had his friend do. He then calls Matt Kelch the week. He picked and choose <laughs> what he wanted extracted. And uh, of this uh, uh, incident uh, to do the limited extraction. He never tells uh, Trooper Buchnick or Trooper Prochner how he extracted the test. Uh, despite the fact that it was done by a friend of his in the federal government. Um, during the federal proffer, Brian Higgins admits that he had been served with a preservation order and the Commonwealth told him he could destroy his phone despite the order. He then drives to a military base on it's Cape Cod, opens his phone, breaks the SIM card, and throws the phone away. And he says that he discussed destroying his phone with Brian Albert. Brian Albert also destroyed his phone. Why? And Brian Albert... I said this before. People caught in a situation like this, people that are in a situation like this, they don't destroy their phones if they don't have something to hide. It's flat out. They don't destroy their phones if they don't have something like guilty. I mean, innocent people don't destroy their phones. They would be apt to turn them over and say, yes, please take my phone. I had nothing to do with this. Here's all of my data. Please have it. For the record, I was this, this, this in here, and my phone will show that. This is very, very interesting. Believe me, this is this is jaw dropping right here. Uh, said that he had uh, received some text that in my opinion, two grown men that are trying to hide something. And after that, Brian Higgins changes his phone number and changes his cell carrier. In short, he was present that night. He had a motive, and there is plenty of consciousness of guilt, cover up evidence with regard to Mr. Higgins. Moving on to Colin Albert. Shortly before January 29th of 2022, Colin Albert lived with his parents. 
Christopher Albert and Julie Albert on John O'Keefe's street, just two doors down. We have evidence of bad blood between Colin Albert and John O'Keefe. We have evidence. How old, how old wow. was Colin Albert at that time? I believe he was 16 at that time. Okay. We have evidence that Colin Albert and John O'Keefe used to get in confrontations because Colin Albert used to cut through his yard without permission and John O'Keefe was not happy about that. We have evidence that Colin Albert used to throw beer cans intentionally into John O'Keefe's bushes and John O'Keefe was not happy, happy about that. We have evidence that Christopher and Julie Albert knew of this conflict. We have evidence that they referred to John, uh, John O'Keefe as never cracker. That's a character from a, I think a kid's movie uh, who was known as the get off my lawn guy. When John O'Keefe and Karen Reed were vacationing in Aruba over this New Year's crazy Eve right 2022, here. the Alberts, Christopher and Julie taunted him. They went to his porch and they had photos taken of themselves drinking on John's property when he wasn't there to do anything about it, evidencing they knew how upset he was at what Colin Albert had been doing. Now, the investigators in this case, Your Honor, including Michael Proctor, kept Colin Albert's name completely out of the police report. When this case began, I had no idea who Colin Albert was. Um, I received a tip right from the jump that Brian Albert and his nephew had beaten up John O'Keefe. I didn't even know Brian o Albert had a nephew at that time. But after receiving the tip, I learned of the conflict that Colin Albert had with John O'Keefe. So I sent a letter to Mr. Lally, I believe by certified mail. I knew that the DA's office was planning to present evidence or witnesses to a grand jury. And at that early juncture, before anybody uh, had, been, had asked them to indict, um, I notified the DA of three potential suspects, the ones that I'm talking about now, Brian Higgins, Brian Albert, and Colin Albert. Um, after he received that letter at our next court appearance, I'm sure Mr. Lally can confirm this, um, he acknowledged that both Brian Albert and Brian Higgins would be testifying or had testified before the grand jury, but he questioned why I included Colin Albert in my letter. Wow. He told me at the time that he had no evidence that Colin Albert was there that night. Oh yeah. However, after However. receiving my letter, lo and behold, multiple witnesses testified that Colin Albert was at 34 Fairview <clears throat> the night of January 28th to 29th. Wow. And now the DA will multiple argue, I'm sure, at trial testified. that he left before Joan O'Keefe arrived. We don't find their evidence compelling. Wow. We don't accept it. We are not required to accept their theory of the case. We're entitled to present a defense. Yeah. Yep. His presence at 34 Fairview gave him the opportunity, along with the motive, to harm John O'Keefe. This is going to be like one of the biggest cases of all time. I'm telling you. This is this case is going to be wild. I'm I'm almost, you know, like listen, like I obviously don't want this to go to trial. Um, but I'm almost salivating at the fact of like every bit of piece of information that we're going to hear. We're, and I'm telling you, every day when you hear new testimony and you hear the defense uh, testify and put out their theories, their, their evidence, their witnesses, your mouth is going to drop on the ground. I'm telling you, it's going to be spellbinding, what, spellbounding what they put out there. Uh, and this is just warm up. This is just warm up for Jackson, Yanetti, and Little. <laughs> wait, wait to find, you know, it's going to be more detailed. That's it. like you always have, like, that's what you have to think about. And I even say that in like the Idaho 4 case. If, any, if anybody falls out, the Brian Koberger Idaho 4 case, you know, it, when we hear that opening statement from the prosecution and they lay out their, their idea of how Brian Koberger came involved with those four stu college students, your mouth is going to drop on the ground. Uh, just fascinating how you get from point A to point B in, in these cases. All right, let's finish this out. And then we're going to play the, uh, the arrest video from, uh, Lally, Lally explaining and Lally lying. With regard to Brian Albert, your honor, um, this is a well-connected, well-known, powerful family in the town of Canton, Massachusetts. Brian Albert was present at that home when Colin Albert Ooh. was there. <coughs> Colin
Colin Albert is a member of the Albert family. He's nephew of Brian Albert. We have evidence that Brian Albert had expressed hostility toward John O'Keefe as well. <clears throat> and we know that he initiated a phone call with Brian Higgins at 2.22 in the morning. He reached out to Brian Higgins. And then he picked up the phone when Brian Higgins came back and they spoke for 22 seconds. And they never revealed any of that to investigators again. And it's funny that they destroyed their phones. <laughs> Both of them destroyed their phones after that conversation. Consciousness of guilt and perhaps most of all, Brian Albert is a first responder. He is I love this part right here. He bound to help somebody who's in trouble. He was notified that John O'Keefe was in trouble. Brian Albert stayed in his home. home. He knew what was going on outside. His sister-in-law was out there, civilians, medical personnel eventually arrived. He did nothing. That is also consciousness of guilt. Now, Your Honor, with regard to all of that third-party culprit evidence to admit it substantively, which I would assert to the court is, is both overwhelming and powerful, with regard to the Bowdoin uh, argument here, the police investigated none of that. That didn't come from the Commonwealth. They had a, a complete lack of curiosity as to what was going on in that house that night. They didn't care. Investigators never went in. The feds investigated, and that's where we got a majority of this evidence. So, you know, to, to the extent that the Commonwealth now claims that they didn't have notice of this, um, I, I beg to defer. They, they got notice of this when we got notice of this. Uh, you know, the Finney case, Your Honor, again, I'm, I'm well familiar with it. It stood for the proposition that, you know, if, if you want to point the finger at a third party culprit, you've got a constitutional right to do that. And if you want to point out inadequacies in a police investigation, you have a constitutional right to do that. It is for those reasons that I ask you to deny the Commonwealth's motions. Okay, thank you. Any response? Mr. I <sighs> hear that sigh. Jeez, man. Let's go back and hear that sigh. Inadequacies in a police investigation, you have a constitutional right to do that. It is for those reasons that I ask you to deny the Commonwealth's motions. Okay, thank you. Any response, Mr. Lally? Uh, briefly, Your Honor. <clears throat> Another sigh. Um, just first, uh, again, what, what the case law requires is evidence and not just mere speculation. Or saying explaining. that you have evidence is not actually evidence. Um, <laughs> I, I do find it somewhat... <laughs> that, I love that line. I want to put that on a t-shirt. Just because you have evidence doesn't mean that it's evidence. I love that. That is the... I, I remember that line. It's the greatest line. He says, just because you have evidence doesn't mean that it is evidence. I, I got to hear that again. That is the greatest line. <laughs> I love it. Um, just first, uh, again, what, what the case law requires is evidence and not just mere speculation or saying that you have evidence is not actually evidence. Um, <laughs> I do find it somewhat interesting that Mr. Yannetti uh, wrote apparently four and a half pages of notes but didn't have time to write a motion uh, to admit uh, the evidence uh, that he claims that he has. Um, he references in regard to uh, third party culprit, uh, Dr. Sheridan, uh, who indicated that the injuries are consistent with the fight. He's the same doctor who indicated that the injuries on uh, Mr. O'Keefe's arm were consistent with the dog bite, which uh, was refuted by the DNA findings from UC Davis, as well as the fact that the injuries are only on one side of the arm. And last time I checked, uh, dogs have teeth uh, on the top and the bottom, and there's no injuries to the bottom of Mr. O'Keefe's <laughs> arm. Uh, furthermore, the council references the federal grand jury materials in which uh, I would say, uh, as 
has been done numerous times previously is, is severely mischaracterized as to what they actually contain. Uh, so what, uh, the, and it's not a crash reconstructionist as it's been alleged here before, it's a biomechanical engineer. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And essentially what they did was take painstaking lengths uh, to go to, uh, to determine that uh, the defendant's vehicle did not strike uh, Mr. O'Keefe in the back of the head, which is simply something that no one has ever said, intimated at any point ever. Um, there is also a medical examiner uh, in the federal materials who concurs uh, completely with Dr. Scordibello's uh, findings as it pertains uh, to the cause and manner of death. So with regard to each of these, the other thing that I would point out is, is counsel was uh, counsel record with the Finney case. The Finney case relates to third party culprit under the Bowdoin event. So it's not applicable to what counsel uh, was arguing. Um, it is a low standard, but it's also one that the defendant here has not met. It's not one without limits. Uh, as it pertains to much of, of the material uh, that it was uh, summarized uh, as far as uh, speculation as to what different things uh, counsel feels mean uh, from, from various uh, things regarding Mr. Higgins, uh, Colin Albert, and Brian Albert, just starting with Colin Albert, because that's frankly the easiest. He wasn't at the house, and that's what the federal materials confirm with each of every single of the witnesses that were spoken to by uh, the district attorney's office or the troopers or testified to the state grand jury. They testified to the exact same things in the federal grand jury, that Colin Albert had left the house prior to uh, the defendant and the victim arriving there, and there's absolutely nothing uh, to combat that whatsoever, uh, other than, again, just rank speculation. So opportunity would be a little bit amiss uh, if he's not even there at the same time uh, as Mr. O'Keefe, regardless of, of the invalidity of any sort of uh, you know ill feelings or ongoing feud uh, that's purported uh, from whatever unknown evidence uh, counsel claims to have. In regard to Mr. Higgins, uh, that, that, that was a fanciful story, but again, there's actually no actual evidence of, of most of those things, uh, or at least the, the imputations or the connotations uh, the council wants to put uh, behind uh, that. Um, whatever he feels, uh, things were observed. Um, so again, I'm not sure where the evidence uh, from this is coming from. Uh, what I'm also a little confused in regard to is that if Council is merely relying on materials within the federal grand jury um, and just learned of them at that same time as, as we learned of them when uh, materials were provided pursuant to TUI, uh, then it's a little peculiar that the exact same arguments uh, were being made throughout the pendency of the case well, well, well before uh, Council was provided with any of those uh, federal materials. Um, what Council just went through is essentially a list of rank speculation and not actual rank evidence. Um, as far as the mysterious uh, portion that's missing uh, from the, the Sally port, there's a number of different, it's, it's a motion activated camera for the most part. The other thing that I would uh, direct the court's attention to as it was continued. This is where he's going to get caught. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he stands up and basically says, uh, well, if uh, it's a motion camera and there's motion near it, then the camera should turn on, right? And within the state grand jury proceedings uh, is there is cruiser camera video from the Canton Police Cruisers. Specifically, there is cruiser camera video from Cruiser 6A2. Specifically, there is cruiser camera video from Cruiser 6A2 at 8.22 in the morning uh, when a lieutenant and sergeant from the Canton Police on their own go over to One Meadows Ave, which is the, the residence of Mr. O'Keefe to do a well-being check because they had not received any information as to how the children were or if they were there being attended to. And they pull into the driveway at 8.22 in the morning, directly behind the defendant's vehicle, which is exactly where Ms. McKay parked it when they stopped there to see if Mr. O'Keefe was there before then piling into Ms. Roberts's vehicle and proceeding to 34 Fairview. And what you can see within that cruiser camera video at 8.22 in the morning is the damage to the right rear taillight of the defendant's vehicle. Well before the defendant had then come back to the house after the hospital and then gotten in three separate cars with her family and driven in a blizzard all the way back to her parents' house in Dighton. And then the vehicle had then been towed from Dighton back to the Cannon Police Station uh, by the state police with the assistance of the Dighton police.
Pat, thank you so much for the $9.99. I appreciate the support. Thank you. Thank you for the super chat. Super duper duper chat. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Do you know what exhibit number that is before the grand jury? I believe it's 56, but I, I, I may be, I, I can certainly locate uh, uh, that uh, information. And again, as far as Brian Albert is concerned, I, I heard nothing other than he's apparently in a well-connected family in Canton and Colin is his nephew who wasn't present at the house when Mr. O'Keefe and Ms. Reed were present at the house. So again, I think it's a stronger argument, certainly, if, if we're trying to bootstrap onto a Bowdoin defense uh, and counsel will probably likely be allowed to uh, at least investigate that as far as impeachment, cross-examination, things of that nature. But there is absolutely nothing beyond just a, a fertile imagination and rank speculation as it applies to a third-party culprit defense. And for that reason, uh, the Commonwealth's motion to exclude it should be allowed. Hi. The only thing I'd like to correct, Your Honor, is, well, right or at here. least point out is that, um, you know, the car pinged at 5.30. So hold, hold on until you get to the microphone. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, the car pinged at 5.36 p.m., indicating that it was in the Sally Port. Um, there is an outdoor camera where you can see the car about to enter the, uh, the Sally Port at 5.31. Of course, you can't see the tail light in that outdoor, um, you know, camera. But Mr. Lally just argued before you, again. well, the reason why there's no, uh, you know, video of the car uh, between 508 and 550 is that it's motion activated. And I just ask the court to use common sense here that if the car is entering, <laughs> and by the way, the car is there at motion. 550 with a couple of people around it. When the, the camera comes back on, you see the car. So unless it was teleported in a split second so that the, the, the interior camera would not pick up motion, it drove into the Sally port. I believe that's the definition of motion. motion. <laughs> and it should have been picked up according to Mr. Lally's own words. Okay, so when you watch- Real quick, and Bev's just being a you know what right now. Uh, Patrick says, uh, after all this, I don't see how the O'Keefe family doesn't see the truth. I, I have to agree. I have to agree, Pat. Thank you for the five, the four, the four ninety nine er. Thank you for the support. I appreciate it. Walk away from the microphone. It's harder for the court reporter to hear you, Mr. Unetti. And I apologize, Judge. It, it's, um, you know, according to Mr. Lally's own words, it should have picked up the movement. Okay. All right. So I believe that's the last motion. So why don't we recess until two o'clock? And I'll see you back here at two, Mr. Lally. Will you have? Uh, Ms. Gilman, who I did see walk in here at one point, set up the screen Oops, right where we normally keep it. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Let's go to the very ending of this hearing. I appreciate everybody being here. Uh, it's a long hearing, almost three hours in. Thank you all for being here and uh, following along with me. Let's go to the last like 10 minutes or so of this hearing. Uh, let's play through this. I already have it queued up, and it should come into play here in a second. Here we go. If this is your first time over here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe. I'm trying to get back into the regular game here and do some regular streams. I've just been extremely, extremely overstretched uh, and tired uh, with my personal life, balancing that, getting the studio up and running. Uh, it's been it's been a stressful process, but it's getting there. A uh, few more things to button up, and uh, we should get it rolling here pretty soon. So, thank you all for being here. I, I do appreciate it. All right, let's get into the last bit of this hearing. Judge, I'm taking the stand. Uh, oh. here we go. Okay, thank you. Back on the record on the Karen Reed matter. Okay, so good afternoon, counsel. Good afternoon, Ms. Gilman. I appreciate you being here. Um, before we see this video, just briefly, I just want to say that there were really only two motions that I'm comfortable with deciding uh, by the two o'clock call here. Uh, Conwell's motion in limine of intent to obtain Corey. I don't know if I already allowed that, but that's allowed. Can you just answer this, Angela? It's going to really be what my schedule dictates. You know, lately I've been so overstretched. Um, I, a lot of people have to understand, like, I work a full-time job and my hours vary all the time. So it's 
what I can do, what I can get out there, and what I can do. Um, it's just really hectic in my personal life right now. And unfortunately, I got to work full-time job to pay the bills. So uh, streaming right now has been kind of taking a backseat. And a lot of my free time has been going to getting my studio up and running because it's got to get going. <laughs> we got to get that moving. So uh, I'm trying my best. I am trying my best. Thank you for asking, though. All right, let's finish this upper. And the uh, Commonwealth motion oh, eliminate to, I think this is 317. Commonwealth motion I'm eliminate to prohibit reference. My dream, of course, is... Uh, you know, my projection is hopefully a year from now, I can scale back into a part-time capacity at a job. And then hopefully, you know, another year from now, I'm free from that full-time job. And this becomes my career. Uh, I want to do this for the rest of my life in some capacity. So, um, you know, I just need to keep getting this channel out there into the algorithm, bring in more subscribers, bring in more viewers. Uh, I appreciate everybody's support for keeping the lights on, especially keeping the lights on in the new studio now. So it, it definitely helps. Um, but you know, that's my dream. That's my vision. So hopefully it happens. You never know. You never know what can happen, but we're just going to keep rolling through, keep pushing through, never give up, have a strong work ethic and, and go for it. All right, let's play to any federal investigations conducted by the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, or FBI. So that will come into evidence the way that it typically does here in Massachusetts. You can question as to a date where the statement was made under oath, and we can discuss it um, as it gets closer in more detail. So the other motions are under advisement. We'll talk about that when we come back to sort of housekeeping matters uh, at the end of the day. So uh, do you have that video all pulled up, Mr. Lally, for me to see? Yes, yeah, Sean. Okay. And Your Honor, for the record, uh, it's a little bit lengthy as far as the entirety of the video. The portion uh, that I would be submitting to the court is from uh, seven minutes and four seconds until nine minutes and 55 seconds. Okay. Now, isn't this the ridiculous part here where Lally's going to try to explain and say that that call is it Colin and Brian? I, I don't know. I think I get confused on this. Colin and Brian were the ones that smashed John's head onto the back of her taillight. I, am I getting that right? I think that's what this was. Can we? Thank you. Make any sense? So we left at the house. I told you just did the the knock on lock. Okay. Um, can you explain to me what the process is right now? Absolutely. So you're going to be uh, well, just like last time. Uh, go through the same process, it's going to be a little less uh, time consuming because we're not going to do major case prints because we did those last time. Um, once you're booked and you go through this portion of it, we'll uh, let you make a phone call just like last time. We'll make a phone call. Uh, your parents will be. Just to make it clear, this is the second time that she's been arrested. Able to bring you whatever other well, why additional, I... additional needs, uh, things that you need, yeah. and then um, and then tomorrow morning um, you'll go and be arraigned at Norfolk Superior Court on the charges that were. I'm sure you'll go over the charges again with you on the warrant. But I'm on bail, so how can I be yeah, spending I'll... the night here again? All right, so I'll explain that portion to you. As long as it's not going to interfere with you, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm just waiting for Rams to... Okay. So, um, initially, your arrest was on probable cause out of uh, the district court, okay? So, the charges that you were arrested on initially were out of the district court, out of the Stilton district. That's where the arraignment was. It was, it was uh, district uh, level charges. Um, today, grand jury indicted you on these charges, which is second degree murder, uh, uh, homicide, and um, leaving the scene of a death. Okay, 
So those are the charges the grand jury indicted you on. So now you're being charged and will be arraigned in the Superior Court, go for the county Superior Court in Delaware. Okay. So bail doesn't apply anymore? Uh, typically, I, I'm not, so we don't set the bail. But typically, once murder comes into play, people don't get bailed out. So it's not manslaughter anymore. Is that the difference? That's correct. It's a higher degree of taking a life. Okay, so those, that's the charges that you're being charged with now. And you were indicted by Craig Jury. Okay, you're aware he was beaten up by Brian and Colin Albert. Okay. We're all in on the same joke, right? My tail light is cracked and John is pulverized. Okay, you you need to uh, abide by the, the the rights that were afforded to you. Okay, so uh, you can you can talk if you want. If you want to talk, tell us what happened, that's fine. We'll listen, but you were ready to give you the rights, okay? And, and I'm sure he's going to do it again. All right, if you want to talk to us, you want to give us, give us um, uh, a story? Definitely. But we'll, we'll take no, it. No, I don't. I mean, I know you already know the story, so I don't need to. Yeah, I mean, and this is a good point because I was just thinking this, Emmy. It's almost awesome that she did say something i, I think that's going to be a big uh pull for the defense i have to agree emmy i was just thinking that myself i i completely agree that's how an innocent woman would talk like i can't believe this so what, what are you telling me is they're upgrading my charges now we're all in on the same joke like She's she's thinking in her head, like, I cannot believe that I'm stuck in this dream. We're all in the same joke here, right? Like, she's like, is Candy Camera going to jump out? Like, what's going on? All right. Um, how long is the entire tape? So that is uh, Trooper Pai, uh, who was the arrest. Uh, 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 story? Definitely. We'll, we'll take no, no, I mean, I know you're not sorry, so I'm sorry. All right. Um, how long is the entire tape? I like looking at this is like Lally's computer. You can see everything on there. <laughs> the piano guys. What's that? Yeah, my tail light was cracked, not shattered. Yeah. And you got to think. Karen hasn't even had a full conversation with counsel yet, so there's no way that. If she was lying, they spin this up and he says, just keep saying cracked, just keep saying cracked. You know, you got to think about that. She hasn't even had any full conversation with an attorney yet. So if she really did do this, the attorney could coach, you know what I'm saying? The attorney could coach her and say, oh, just keep saying cracked, you know? She hasn't even had a conversation yet. What is the piano, guys? So that is uh, Trooper Pai, uh, who was the arresting officer um, from the barracks. So it goes, I believe, uh, at least 90 minutes or so. All right. Do you have the entire, we're not playing it now, but do you have the entire video? All right. I would like it marked for identification. Sure. I'd also like a copy of it so I can view the whole entire thing, put it all in context. I never like to see just seconds. Yeah, he may have been her attorney. Uh, how long? How long after did she get rearrested? Was it a month, or was it like a, just a, it was like a couple of days, wasn't it? Wasn't it only just a couple of days after she got re re arrested and the charges get got bumped up? So I'm saying they, they wouldn't have an, a full conversation of this whole case yet if it's just in that short amount of time. If it's been a month, yeah, of course, but. I think it was only like a couple of days. Actions. <clears throat> like May and then June. Uh, can I get that for the weekend as well? Oh, absolutely. And, and for the record, as far as I, I think a lot of that sort of preliminary stuff was more meant as context for the court. Um, you know, okay. there's certain discussions about court procedure and things that I, I don't think should be put in front of the jury. Uh, all right. So that, that was my concern as well. Um, Okay, so it's something I'll watch a few times and um, the whole thing as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you very much. All right.
Okay, so housekeeping matters. Uh, a few things that I still need, as you know, to before we have the jury here on Tuesday, I need a statement of the case. I know you have a short, short statement of the case in your um, proposed supplemental questionnaire. Uh, I think it needs to be more than that. So before you leave today, I'd like you all to agree on a joint statement of the case. I need witness lists. If the witnesses are going to be called, I have to read their names, as you know, to the jury on Tuesday morning. Once we get a jury, and I know none of us knows how long that might take, how long will it take to put in the Commonwealth's case? You can tell me with DNA and without DNA. Um, so with that piece of DNA, I don't think that that's going to add much more than, than, you know, an hour or two at the most. Um, but best guess, uh, given the schedule as outlined uh, previously by the court, um, I'd say probably at least four weeks. My, my hope is um, there are some witnesses on the Commonwealth's witness list uh, who are essentially testifying just in regard to um, administrative things as far as, you know, work in an establishment. This is a true and accurate copy of surveillance video from said establishment. Have you had preliminary discussions about whether there would be stipulations to authenticity like that? No, but, but, but I plan to... Uh, before Tuesday. Okay. And you'll do that, Ms. Giannetti? You'll have these conversations before Tuesday? I'm completely open to that. Okay. Um, so with the Commonwealth's case going four weeks, how long does the defense think their case will go? With the schedule that the court has outlined, we're estimating about two weeks, Judge. Okay. All right. I need to tell the jurors how long it will take. So if you say six weeks, I'm going to tell them seven, which will make it longer for us to get a jury. But um, I understood. And then there's also the X factor of how long it takes to get a jury. Right? Oh, exactly. No, I'm going to tell them once we get a jury, it will be seven weeks, give or take. And just, just while we're on this subject, Your Honor, um, does the court have any idea in terms of the availability of jurors every day of the week? Uh, while we don't have jurors on Fridays. No jurors on Fridays. No, and it gets progressively lower as okay. the week goes on. But we've got jurors. <laughs> Once we start, the, the trial that is impaneling has priority over all other trials. Okay. So once we start, and I expect that we'll start on Tuesday, um, We'll do that. So uh, there's a couple of things about the voir dire oh of the jurors. Um, so we will do the voir dire, the individual voir dire of jurors over here at Sidebar. Um, and only one lawyer from each side is permitted to ask the questions of the jurors. I think I'd probably be able to give you five minutes or so for each witness, no more. Uh, and I'd like to talk to you all at Sidebar now about your... Um, joint proposal uh, of the questionnaire. This is something that is not public. It won't be made public until after it's decided upon and uh, after it is presented to the jurors and they've filled it out. So a blank copy will be available then pursuant to what the law is. So why don't I see counsel at sidebar? Is this safe, Excuse me? Is this yes, thank you. I think this is going to just break. They're going to have like a 20 minute sidebar and then court's going to break. Let's see here. All right, so is that everything regarding housekeeping, logistics, things like that? Yes, Sean. Okay. All right. So we'll see you on Tuesday morning. That's it. All right, just just so we're clear, there's nothing else logistically or jury impanelment, right? We're good? I, I believe so, Your Honor, yes. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, so we'll see everybody Tuesday morning. <laughs> I need to see. Is that Zoom off? <laughs> Goodbye.
Well, that's it. I just can't believe that we're we're in this position. You know, Karen shouldn't be in this position. It's sad. It's it's really heartbreaking. You know that uh, this uh, innocent woman is going to have to go through this. You know, and I I think that people have to understand the totality of the situation. Karen in a, in a few weeks is going to be fighting for her life to stay out of jail for the rest of her life. Um, and she shouldn't be in this position. She should not be in this position. It's just a tra it's a tra you know it's a travesty. It's a travesty of justice to have her here in this position. But I feel like um, she has been blessed with uh, the 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 lawyers that are capable of handling this, and the lawyers that will exon get her exonerated. That will present the evidence and facts in her defense and shred everything that the commonwealth is going to throw at them and shred it to to nothing and there's just so much reasonable doubt in this case there's so much cover-up there's so much obvious points um that karen didn't do this oh boy but uh my friends very very long stream we just hit over the three hour mark i appreciate everybody being here this evening I'm looking uh, forward to getting back into a regular streaming schedule here soon. Um, I will have a review and recap tomorrow night as well. We'll do some more Karen Reed, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Hope that I can see all of you over here, and I will keep you all updated on uh, the studio build out. So thank you for all being here. I appreciate you all being here, and I will see you all soon. Everybody have a great night. Talk to y'all soon. Bye bye. LTL true crime, we gon' deep in the dark. Peeling back the layers, expose the hidden marks. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie. Getting into minds of the wicked, no alibi. LTL true crime, arrival in the web of evil. No stone left unturned, we diving through the prime. Yeah, we digging up the dirt, bringing justice to the crime. LTL, true crime, I'm feeling dark realities every time. Yeah, LTL, true crime, we going deep in the dark. Peeling back the layers, expose the hidden march. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie. Getting in the minds of the wicked, no alibi. LTL, true crime, unraveling the web of evil. No soul left unturned, we dive into the crime. Yeah, we digging up the dirt, bringing justice to the crime. LTL, true crime, I'm villain, dark realities every time. LTL, true crime, we go deep in the dark. Peeling back the layers, expose the hidden marks. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie. Getting into minds of the wicked, no alibi. LTL, true crime, unravel in the web of evil. No stone left unturned, we dive into the prime. LTL true crime, we going deep in the dark. Yeah. Peeling back the layers, expose the hidden mark. Yeah. From the streets to the alleys where the secrets lie. Getting into minds of a wicked no alibi. alibi. LTL true crime, unraveling the web of evil. No stone left unturned, we dive into the prime. Yeah, we digging up the dirt, bringing justice to the crime.